Assalamu alaikum, good evening and good morning uh, to everyone they are listening to us wherever you are. Uh, I would like to welcome our uh, eminent and esteemed uh, speakers. Uh, I'm proud today to have uh, really an eminent speaker from everywhere from the world. We are having a very eminent speaker from India that representing Asia, if she allow me to say that. We are having also uh, speakers from the regional area, local area, Middle East, and we have from United States of America. Uh, welcome all. Uh, and I will uh, just introduce all the speaker once so that we can have a time then for the presentation without interruptions. Um, with panelists here, we are having Dr. Yahya Salahuddin, is a well-known figure, professor of ophthalmology, Cairo University, chairman of Eye uh, Care Center, cataract cornea and refractive surgeon consultant. We know him, Dr. Yahya, for a long time, and he is one of eminent speakers in the Middle East and worldwide as a cataract and refractive surgeon. Uh, also in uh, panelist, Dr. Uh, Safwan Al-Bayati, my dear friend, he's a fellowship of Royal of College of Physician and Surgeon of Glasgow, uh, uh, owner and medical director of New Vision Eye Center in Dubai. He's a PECO refractive and vitreoretinal surgeon. And Dr. Safwan also a well-known figure here in our area, Middle East and worldwide, especially in the refractive surgery. Uh, also, we are proud also to have today from Jordan, dear friends, Dr. Amal Warikat. She is an MD, FRCS, Glasgow. She is a cornea and refractive surgeon consultant, Royal Medical Service, King Hussein Medical Center, Amman, Jordan. Uh, welcome to all, but unless they are going to be with me in moderating and discussing these sessions. For speakers, we'll have the first speaker, Dr. Muhammad Imad Alilo, dear friend, he's a specialist of pharmacist in a care hospital charger, and he's a cataract and refractive surgeon, and he is well known also uh, uh, figures in United Arab Emirates and also in the Middle East, and he is delivered a lot of talks in his specialty. Um, also today, it's my pleasure and honor also to introduce and to have uh, Dr. Narmata Sharma, Professor of Ophthalmology, MD and DNB, MNAMS. She is a cornea cataract and refractive surgery, su su surgery service. Uh, she is also in Dr. Uh, Rajendarar Prasad Center for Ophthalmology Science, all the Indian Institute of Medical Science. Uh, Dr. Narmata, she is having uh, a lot of publications as I do remember, maybe around 450 publications. She is also have a many uh, national and uh, international awards uh, for, uh, I cannot you know, now count it, I read her. It was an amazing and actually an honor, honor and pleasure to be with us, Dr. Thank you. Also, it's my pleasure to introduce my friends, Dr. Yasin Dawood, Chair of Ophthalmology, uh, Howard, uh, County General, Howard County, sorry, General Hospital, Associate Professor of Ophthalmology, also Dr. Yasin, also our known figure in cataract and refractive surgery. And also pleasure to introduce one of the main figures in ophthalmology, also Dr. Zena al muhtasab MD, Associate Professor of Ophthalmology Department, Baylor College of Medicine, USA. Um, not last, also before, also the last one, Dr. Ahmed Al Barqi. He is an MD, FRCS ophthalmology consultant, Peter Retinal Surgeon, Sheikh Khalifa Medical City, Abu Dhabi, UAE. And lastly, my dear friend from Saudi Arabia, Dr. Saad Wahib, Associate Professor of Ophthalmology, Kenji Abdul Aziz University College of Medicine, KSA, Head of Section of Ophthalmology in King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center in Jeddah, KSM. Thank you for all of you for being with us. And really it's amazing. And, and I mean, it will be a, a very high level of uh, scientific program with your presence. Highly appreciated for being with us and accepting our invitations. So I will start now with the first speakers. My dear friend, Dr. Imad Alilo is going to talk about ocular service disease between facts and myths. Dr. Imad, the mic with you. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad, for the nice introduction. I'm going to share screen now, if you don't mind. Can I ask all the speakers, please, to be mute so they can allow them without?
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues and friends, good evening. Tonight, we will talk, uh, we will go on a little journey around the ocular surface world. This fascinating world, uh, it's a good example of what Einstein once said. Not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. This simple truth, if we want to think about it, we can see that it is perfectly matched the ocular surface physiology because it's a really a complicated environment when you have a lot of factors that you uh, don't understand it perfectly, but it works together to give you uh, a different result in each case. My curiosity about that uh, started long back in 2007, 2008, when I done my uh, uh, ocular surface or cornea program in the Orbis Flying Hospital. I was working with Professor Woodford Van Meter and Professor Pasik at that days, and I was really surprised how people act differently after keratoplasty. Some, pay, some cases you can see next day crystal clear cornea, the others, it takes a long time to recover and extended healing. This uh, arose me, uh, arose my curiosity and gave me a passion. That passion took me far away to Nottingham University in 2010 when I have joined an extensive course with Professor Dua. In this very uh, experienced uh, or very specialized center when you have referrals from all over UK and sometimes from Europe as well. When you can sit beside Professor Dua and see all of these kinds of cases and see how uh, he had to analyze every case separately and acts. Then I realized it is not a simple or straightforward thing. It's a complicated world actually. When you have a lot of factors to work as an uh, orchestra in one harmony in order to have uh, the good performance. And uh, slowly in the last few years, we start to understand that there is a mechanism for or orchestrating the homeostasis among tear production, cornea nerves, immune cells, cornea and liberal stem cells, and the eyelid margins in terms of structure and function. So this multifactorial uh, uh, system uh, led to more understanding that uh, there is so many factors interfering uh, neural uh, vascular, hormonal, and immunal system. So recently we understand more and more the role of inflammation in the ocular surface problem, especially the dry eye, when we have this viscous circle, uh, which when each aspect are enhancing the other one. So uh, any one of us can suddenly, whether for intrinsic factor or extrinsic factor, can slide in this vesicus circle. And we need to understand which is the pathology in each case and direct our uh, treatment or management toward it in order to have a very good result. So we are now understanding that it's not only on the ocular surface, it goes beyond the ocular surface to the other parts of the immune system uh, it, like lymph nodes and even spleen. So now we all have almost a consensus, consensus that uh, there is a kind of tear film osmolarity change uh, lead to tear film instability, loss of homeostasis, disrupt of the ocular surface barriers and loss of the corneal epithelium as apoptosis. And we are understanding uh, the new role of this new receptors like ICAM-1. So when you look at the hat from three different aspects, you will get three different point of view. And the clinically, this is what is going on now. Because right now, when you look to the ocular surface disease as a general, you have three uh, approaches, I would say. The first one is the standard one. This is the DOS-2 approach, which uh, go to the majority of the cases. Among this, we have also the more focused approach, which is the American Academy uh, point of care principles. And if we look more widely, we will go 
to the wider circle when which is explained by the cornea and external disease society we will have a quick look for each one of them and how they are dealing with the cases for algorithm one let's say the the dos2 treatment we all know the three or four levels of treatment which we go classically when we have to address each single factor uh, in each case and try to uh, direct our treatment to the defected area in order to sort out the problem. For example, this straightforward case, she is a female, 57 uh, year old. She having some itching, redness, for eye body sensation. There is no history of medication or skin disorders and no history of office work. She have a normal blink rate. So just a, one of the common cases when you can see the high premium of the lead margins, you, you can see the moderate MGD and uh, you can start in this case, we have started standard treatment toward blepharitis. So in the second visit, MGD improved, but there is very mild improvement in the symptoms. So we added liposic. We uh, decided finally, uh, when we see that the standard treatment is not enough to escalate and go for cyclosporine A along with lubricant, and we can see how finally the case respond and the Shermer test went back to normality and the eye looks back. So this approach is quite useful in a straightforward case, but it is not enough when things come to very sensitive cases like people who are candidate for cornea and refractive surgery. When we uh, need to uh, meet the high expectation of those patients by fixing the ocular surface prior to the surgery in order to guarantee that we are having a perfect uh, uh, measurement for our patient. So a lot of armamentorium, new things has been introduced like uh, the questionnaires, the tear lab, the, the inflammatory markers like uh, MBB9, uh, the ocular surface analyzer. And this concept depends on uh, initial evaluation for the ocular surface. If it is okay, we can proceed for our measurement. If not, we need to uh, give a proper treatment to improve the ocular surface prior to uh, before proceeding for our surgery. This is an example of such cases when I have a case of a uh, 62 year old, 62 year old uh, who have, uh, uh, he's coming for a cataract candidate. He's, on, uh, he's a glaucomatous patient on Travatan. He was using it for a long time. So uh, you can see that the ocular surface, the conjunctiva uh, is very congested. The cornea has SPK, very poor tear film. Tear breakup time is uh, uh, around eight seconds and the osmolarity uh, is really high, 325. So in this case, uh, we decided to go to uh, manage that by changing from Taravatan to Saflotan, decrease the preservative free, uh, uh, sorry, decrease the uh, preservative effect on the ocular surface. We add some steroids. We used uh, a good lubricant, extended one like eye cross, and added restasis. Uh, after three months of treatment, we can see that the ocular surface improved, corneal SPK disappeared, tear breakup time improved, osmolarity almost come back to normality. Then we decide we proceeded for uh, the, the surgery. So this is a very important point. We need to take care of it in order to guarantee a good results. Now, we all know that one more important aspect which it is uh, new comes to the market is the lubricants portfolio. We have now very huge uh, portfolio of the lubricant, which is uh, added to be our, our armamentorium. One of the a new player is the iCross uh, 0 0.4. It is a cross-linked hyaluronic acid. This interesting uh, concept uh, means that when we cross-link the hyaluronic acid sodium hyaluronate, we have two kinds of uh, new uh, connections, the intramolecular cross-linking and the intermolecular cross-linking. This uh, unique structure gives more stability on the ocular surface, and it is uh, having special resistance to hyaluronidase, which usually fragment the hyaluronic acid and uh, prevent its effect anymore. So we can have uh, some extended uh, effect on the ocular surface, and that was proven when uh, we, we measure the surface asymmetry index and the surface regularity index, 
in one study using the Pentacam, and it proven that comparing that uh, new modified structure with the standard lubricant, it gives uh, more e effect because it lasts longer in the ocular surface. So this new, uh, this new player in this field can give us more stability and accelerates the corneal epithelial meaning. It's just one of the new factors which we are having it and can help us in managing our cases. When we go to the wider, when we go a little bit far and look to the wider scope of uh, the ocular surface disease, we come to the uh, unique approach of cornea external disease and refractive society, which has uh, stated the dysfunction tear syndrome concept. When, where there is a multifactorial, it, which is started of course in 2017, uh, it's a multifactorial etiology with overlapping between etiology. This approach is more realistic because it's mix. It is not something standard, which uh, is the same as uh, the control triad. We, you can eliminate whatever you want. No, this one is trying to deal with the real world, with the variety of cases, and admit that there is mixing of factors which lead to the pathology we are seeing. So. And the, 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 unique, uh, uh, the unique point in this algorithm is looks uh, or it's stated the management in a step ladder manner. So the management depending on step-by-step -step strategy like as we deal with glaucoma and uh, it's also includes the using the wide variety of medications and even procedures, which some of them are off labels sometimes to achieve our goal. So uh, this, approach, this function tear film has uh, classified the dry eye into aqueous deficiency, blepharitis, evaporative from goblet cells or murine deficiency, and exposure keratopathy. And it's introduced a new concept, which is the co-conspirators. This is a kind of pathology which mimic this function tear syndrome, but it has its own uh, pathophysiology, like allergic keratoconjunctivitis, like superior limbic keratoconjunctivitis, conjunctival calases, thyxins, and even the effect of uh, medicamentosa, which we all know uh, its effect on the ocular surface. If we want to use this approach, we can look at this case. 25-year-old female, very young and active. She came, uh, she's working eight to to 10 hours in an office job. She came with pain, redness, blurred vision in, uh, in both eyes uh, due to her extended use of contact lens. She was using it for more than 10 years now. When you look to the cornea, you can see this uh, unique shape of ground glass cornea. You can see that the periphery has a lot of panels. The center, when you have uh, this uh, shape of uh, SPK and ground glass appearance, the vision deteriorated in the right eye to 624, in the left eye to 612. Now, uh, when you look carefully to the cornea, you realize that there is, uh, beside the panus, there is two different types of epithelium in this cornea. You can understand that the extended usage of uh, contact lens has destroyed the barrier of the stem cells and facilitated a kind of conjunctivization of uh, the cornea by letting the, co the conjunctive epithelium uh, slide over the cornea. So in this case, when you want to manage it, uh, you have two approaches, the uh, conservative one and the invasive one. I decide to mix and match in the right eye when the, uh, the uh, cornea or the, uh, this conjunctival epithelium was even covering the center, I decide to do what we call sequential, uh, S-E-E-C-T, uh, sequential, um, uh, we removed the, uh, con the uh, corneal epithelium in the center. We removed all the conjunctival epithelium until we reached to the normal corneal epithelium. And we allowed that uh, corneal surface to heal under the cover of Vigamox. While in the other eye, in the left eye, I decided to go for medical management depending on Lotimax and Lobricant. And this is the right eye when we uh, do the scrapping, you can see that in the second day it start to heal. And after a few days, the right eye has completely healed with very good shiny ocular surface. The left eye, because we did not intervent uh, vigorously, it improves, but it was a little bit slow. So 
this is the final case when you can see that the right eye is quite crystal clear and the left eye is in a good condition. Uh, this kind of cases show us how um, there is multi factors in, uh, uh, interferes in the uh, in, in reaching to the, the certain pathology. This is uh, another case of 30, almost 30 year old female who come to the clinic complaining of decreased vision. She had a smile surgery back in, in October, 2016. And her previous refraction was just a mild refraction, minus 2.5. When you look carefully, you can see that in the right eye, there was a, a certain area of scarring and edema next to the, uh, to the vertical wound when we uh, go usually and extract the lenticule. The pest corrected vision was 612, 618. Uh, pressure was normal, refraction was almost normal, but still she cannot see properly. So if we look carefully to the corneal topography, we can see that suspicious elevation in the posterior and uh, in the anterior and uh, posterior uh, corneal surface in the right eye. And uh, you can see that the D is almost high. In the left eye, you can see almost similar picture, which give you think of uh, having, is it an ectasia post uh, refractive surgery or what is going on in this cornea? So I, I requested the preoperative topography and was suggesting of forfors keratoconus. So it was highly suspicious of poss poss possible ectasia, but the decision was to continue conservative treatment and the golden rule wait and see. After 10 weeks, it start to improve a little bit and scars to settle down. When we look to the topography, we can see it's improves slightly. It is not that quite great improvement, but suddenly what happened is it's improved up to 6.9 and with mild correction to 6.12. And you can see how much the topography has been changed without any uh, serious intervention. It is only the medical treatment there. So I, I cannot explain this case simply because when you have a suspicious uh, cornea and suddenly it turned back to its normal uh, stable, uh, then you think that maybe the keratocytes has played uh, some un understandable role in this case. Uh, so the final case, I'm gonna finish with it. She's a female, uh, 12 year old. She come with decreased vision in the right eye. She was di diagnosed with corneal ulcer and hammered with so many type of antibiotic till it comes with this awful new vascularization, uh, reach the optical center and drop the vision to uh, almost uh, 660. So at the presentation, that was the situation. Uh, when I analyzed the case, the key diagnosis point was she has an intact corneal epithelium, she has decreased corneal sensation and there was a negative corneal swab. So I decided to go and consider it as a herpetic stromal keratitis with proper management of steroids and lubricant she, and, and the coverage of uh, acyclovir. Uh, it was uh, amazingly improved. And finally, after two weeks only, vision went back to 0.8. And of course, she needs further management for this uh, residual new vessels. This variety of cases give us an idea about the complicated etiology, which is interferes in the pathophysiology of the ocular surface disease. We now have different algorithm. We need to use them wisely in managing case by case cases. And we have also new tools in our armamentorium, uh, which help us uh, in tackling these cases like the new immune modulators or the better an advanced formula of lubricants like the cross-linked pyronate. Clinical management is an art rather than a science. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Imad, for this an excellent presentation. Uh, if there are any questions from our uh, panelists to Dr. Imad? Yes, Dr. Safan, fast, please. Yes. You are mute. You are mute, Dr. Safan. Unmuted, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Mohammed was excellent presentation. Only two comments that I need to add is that the use of Tobradex for the uh, marginal uh, congestions and marginal uh, myomyitis, and the use of 
sofleton instead of trabatan in an inflamed eye. So uh, in my uh, opinion, the Tobradex is an, uh, uh, a broad, uh, it's, not, it's not a broad spectrum and it's a bacteriostatic, not bactericidal. So, and it has a very high rate of allergy to tobramycin. So yeah, and my advice is that Tobradex is not the ideal treatment here. And uh, 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 the prostaglandin analog, when you have it and you have this inflammation, inflammation in the ocular surface, changing it to sofleton just to prevent or to reduce the effect of the uh, preservative is not the, the, the key here because sofleton by itself, sorry, the travatan by itself as a prostaglandin, it's creating a lot of intraocular inflammation and this patient uh, uh, prepared for the cataract. So post-op, he will continue on uh, um, uh, prostaglandin and that's one of the causes of the pseudophagic cystic macular changes. Great, thanks. Dr. Safan, okay. Uh... Yes, I have a comment, but very fast, please, yes. because you have you over for, the time. Please. Thank you for your uh, uh, wise comments. The point is that uh, the patient has a medicamentosa reaction. I have to go for some kind of uh, treatment which does not have preservative. Unfortunately, we don't have so much options when it comes to preservative-free glaucoma medication evaluation. Yeah, we have, we have now COSOPT. We have COSOPT now. And uh, sooner we will have uh, a few few medications that will be preserved. Now, COSOP, preservative, preservative free. free. Yes, COSOP, yeah, that's, that's, not, that's nice to hear. Yeah. Also, I, so I think nice Dr. Safan Saplutan is a preservative free. Yes, my dear. I'm, I'm talking about prostaglandin analog because yes. the effect, the inflammatory process coming from the prostaglandin analog. So, sofleton prostaglandin analog, Dr. Muhammad. Yes, okay. but so, just, just one point. It was a medicamentosa reaction, Dr. Safon. Yeah. We need to yes. eliminate that. Regarding Tobradex, I wanted to use dexamethasone because Dotimax was not effective enough. And we don't yeah. have in the market also, if I have a preservative-free dexamethasone, I will be more than happy to use it. Yeah. Yeah, use for the dexamethasone rather than uh, the Tobramice. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much, Dr. Yes. Imad. Thank you, Dr. Safon, for this comment and excellent also Dr. Imad presentation. Uh, stay with us. You will be also in uh, with in discussion involved Welcome. about the episode of cataract five. We are today. We are having. Uh, we are going to talk about the complication of fake emulsification, uh, uh, prevention and management. Uh, and our first speaker, it will be Dr. Narmata Sharma, and she is going to talk about fake emulsification wound related complications. Dr. Narmata, the mic is yours. Please. Thank you, Dr. Amri. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, the organizers of uh, this Middle East uh, Ophthalmology Symposium for uh, making me a part of this. I'm truly honored and it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. would particularly like to thank Dr. Amri for coordinating and... Uh, it's our pleasure and honor, Dr. Thank, thank you so much. So I would come to the, top, the topic of my presentation and that is wound-related uh, complications in FICO emulsification. And uh, there are no financial disclosures, although I would be talking about intraop OCT microscope, uh, uh, which you don't require for it, but it just helps me to explain the wound related complications better. Uh, that is the advantage that you know how I see. Uh, I would be discussing about the, uh, the incision constriction, the construction, the iris related problems, the dismatch membrane attachment that can occur, the femto incision complications, as well as the wound leaks. So now uh, coming to this one, this is an uncooperative patient who's been done under topical anesthesia and notice how the surgeon makes a little ragged incision and it is on to the little more to the left side rather than being on the right side. So uh, it's an irregularly shaped funnel. It is neither rectangular or square as it should be and as is uh, classically uh, described. So uh, it is possible to do FACO, but what would happen is that you would have to distort your wound and with the help of the second instrument, uh, because you need to get that thing into your line of action, a wound will have to be always moved towards the right side. And this may cause a little bit of distortion also, uh, just like uh, in this case. So the model of the story is that the main incision should be at temporal uh, one or two clock hours rightward if you're a right-handed surgeon and never go to the left of the temporal midline and the shape of the funnel should be either square or should be rectangular. Now, there can be pr problems with the improper incision, which could be unstable anterior chamber due to wound leaks, undue resistance in the moving phaco probe. Such wounds are more prone to dismatch membrane detachment 
and of course torsion of the globe can occur while performing surgery due to poor ergonomic position of the handpiece. Now, you can have uh, cases in which there is iris prolapse, uh, which can occur, especially if your incision is a little more limbal or if it is a short tunnel. And in this case, uh, while doing the uh, hydration of the wound, uh, again, one has to be careful uh, where exactly you're doing the hydration, because uh, if you put too much of fluid inside while doing the hydration, which actually goes into the anterior chamber, uh, and is not hydrating, then in that case, the iris uh, prolapse can occur as it uh, occurred in this case. So uh, the, the, the needle where it was going, the, cannula, the, the hydration was not done at the proper plane. An important thing is to just uh, put the iris back, which could be done with the help of the iris cannula or with the help of the uh, spatula and then hydrate at a level which is a little bit anterior uh, as compared to what, what was being done uh, earlier. Now, at the wound site, sometimes you can have these little uh, DMDs. Uh, and uh, again, these are visible only on the intraopposity microscope, but won't be visible otherwise. But if you do happen to see them, then it is best to address them. Uh, you can uh, put a little bit of air bubble there so that the dismiss membrane gets attached. And even when you hydrate the wound, actually the stromal hydrated part it, it uh, gets abutted to the uh, detached portion of the desmix membrane and also uh, the gap is filled up. Now, this is yet an, another case in which uh, FACO emulsification was uh, being done and uh, after completing, it's a short tunnel, inadvertently a limbal incision. So when you do irrigation aspiration, there is, um, with the draw of the instrument, the co there is an iris prolapse. Now, there are two ways of managing such cases. You can put it with the help of the uh, spatula back and then continue to do your biomanual irrigation aspiration or uh, uh, that ideal would have been that. And then the iris is uh, gently nudged back into the anterior chamber as the uh, surgery proceeds. And it is best uh, in this case, uh, as was done to put the intraocular lens and again, um, hydrate the wounds. Uh, you can also put pilocarpine because then the iris would move away from the wound site uh, as the pupil constricts. So iris prolapse can be because of the incision which you've extended or because of posteriorly placed incision, uh, which is going too limbal or because of the short tunnel uh, so that there's premature entry into the anterior chamber. Even if you do an OVD overfill, uh, it can lead to iris prolapse and overzealous wound hydration can also cause iris prolapse, so also can misdirected flow of the fluid cannula as was seen in one of the cases because eddy currents will be generated so that there's sudden increase in the pressure under the iris and the uh, iris uh, prolapse occurs. So whenever uh, there is an iris prolapse before the nucleus management is complete, uh, mostly occurs because of the OVD and it is important that you purge the excess of the OVD because uh, OVD itself can cause the, force the iris to come out. So reposit the iris with a blunt spatula, press the posterior lip to purge more of OVD and insert the phaco probe with the irrigation off and maneuver beyond the pupillary margin and then press the irrigation pretty uh, and then complete surgery with minimum exchanges. And of course, uh, if there is too much of a problem, then you can even abandon the incision and suture and create a new incision. However, if it occurs after the nucleus management is complete, like we saw after complete IA without uh, uh, touching the prolapsed iris, then you reposit the uh, part of the iris, underfill the bag with the OVD, do the bag implantation and hydrate the main incision very gently. And again, inject pilocarpine and air bubble if required. Now, apart from this, from the wound site itself, there can be desmets membrane detachment uh, like it occurred in this case. We did a study and we found that the wound sites may have desmet membrane detachment, but almost all of them would uh, uh, get attached uh, at post-op week one, if not at post-op day one. And uh, uh, there are very few which will not get uh, attached. You can see here in this case at the wound side, this, this tells you the intersection or the area of focus. At the wound side, there's this little small desmets membrane detachment which is there. And when you do hydrate, actually, this spindle will get will come and abut this desmets membrane. So, Partly it will be taken care of, and if it is not taken care of, then from the side port, you can put a little bit of air and then again see that it is uh, getting attached. And the desmets membrane is neither folded nor wrinkled uh, because of the fact that it is uh, attached at the wound site. 
and this is something that one needs to prevent then this is a case in case of pseudo exfoliation in which there is a desmets membrane detachment and also notice there is some wound burn because this was a hard cataract a small pupil and as we are putting viscoelastic you can make out by that bluish reflex that this bmd is increasing and now uh, because this has to be taken out so you have to do it from the main wound only but notice that there is this small dmd which is present here which can be seen so whenever this occurs it is important that from the side port you put some amount of uh, viscoat so that it causes the apposition of the desmets membrane at the wound site to the back of the cornea and once you do that then your maneuvers uh, can be undertaken because viscoat will cause complete apposition uh, but of course when it starts to come out then uh, uh, it may have to be refilled again now again it's very tricky when you have a dmd to inject the um, to implant the intraocular lens but even if you've done that it is again important that you put a air bubble and you see that the desmets membrane is attached and then in such cases it is best not to hydrate the wound because the dmd went almost till the upper upper pupillary margin best to suture it and you can even take full thickness suture so that you take the desmets membrane along with it uh, and this is done with the tenzero monofilament nylon suture so uh, these i have uh, essentially uh, the do's and the don'ts i have already told you whenever there is a wound site desmets membrane detachment don't uh, don't attempt a wound assisted dial injection but it is best to go a little bit inside and then inject because you don't want the edge of the uh, lens uh, hitting on the detached desmets membrane and causing the rip to further extend then apart from that there can be leaking incision such as in this case this is a posterior polar cataract and uh, all leaks have to be uh, determined and in this case phaco emulsification was done followed by a foldable intraocular lens implantation and just as you do this you notice this little area is still blackish in color and there is a leak which is present which you can make out because your air bubble will keep expanding so uh, uh, as you hydrate the wound the main incision leak now at this point in time here is noted and as you hydrate the wound the bubble which was small earlier will start to become bigger and then you know that there is a leak there that will happen only if there is a wound leak there notice how this small bubble which is present here as you hydrate will uh, tend to become bigger uh, because of the presence of the leak and there are various ways of uh, again diagnosing the leaks you can put fluorescein dye to stain that uh, there is a leak or not people have even described the use of tripan blue dye uh, uh, to see whether there is a leak or not and this is a third attempt at hydrating and still it is not getting hydrated so then uh, it is best uh, not to let your ego come in between and to you know suture sir, such wounds uh, uh, so that uh, there is no wound leak present because you don't want complications of wound leak and thereafter now this is just to show you uh, uh, desmets membrane uh, detachment which can occur during the uh, again a wound site detachment which has occurred here which you can see very well uh, which is present here so in all such cases it is best to pilocarpinize the pupil and put the air bubble and then you will see that because of the hydration and also because of the fact that this air bubble is there it gets uh, pretty much uh, attached now uh, there can be this is just a post op day one picture of how a phaco incision wound detachment has occurred and it had led to so much of corneal edema so you pilocarpinize the pupil and again go from the area go from the area which is relatively clear and as you do this the desmets membrane is uh, quite attached but not so much so you may have to do some external massage also in these cases to get the desmets membrane to attach um, uh, and some especially from the wound areas it becomes a little uh, difficult because the fluid the air keeps leaking from the wound area also which is fresh now uh, this is the last uh, uh, clip to show there can be problems with femto incisions as well the femto incision is not opening here and when you look at the intra opposite microscope you'll see that there's a bridge which is present posteriorly not anteriorly and that has to be taken care of and it like classically it has been decided that you can put tripan blue dye and actually see uh, whether the dye is going inside or not and whether uh, where is your uh, incision on the ioct to see tripan blue does help to delineate the edge which sometimes becomes uh, difficult with the femtofaco wounds and uh, you can see that this bridge is attached posteriorly but not anteriorly it is quite uh, i mean it's quite open 
So such cases, uh, one can uh, uh, again uh, use the keratome to uh, open that uh, posterior bridge, uh, and uh, subsequently can the same problem with the side port also. It's not opening up, and then here sharp blade is used to just open that little area of the bridge which is there, and the tunnel of the incision is already present. So you really don't have to do anything much. So uh, I think uh, these have I've already explained. As, uh, if femto incision is not possible, it is always uh, better to abandon the femto incision and make a fresh incision with the keratome. So uh, these were the clips of the wound related uh, problems. At times, they can be also chemosis, which occurs mainly because there's a conjunctival disinsertion, which has occurred at the side port of the main wound. And then uh, one has to uh, give nicks in the conjunctiva and eject out the fluid. So thank you for your kind attention. And I would be very happy to take um, any uh, questions um, that are there. Wound construction is, I think, extremely important because due to small uh, mistakes and due to problems in the wounds, if they are not addressed timely, then it can really get uh, very difficult. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Narmata. It's very excellent uh, talk. Uh, actually, you cover almost of the, uh, the points that we need to hear about it uh, in a very nice way. Uh, there will be a little, maybe some questions and comments. Let me ask Dr. Yahya Salah if you have any comments, please, Dr. Yahya. With us. Thank, you. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Excellent uh, presentation covered all everything. I just have uh, comments uh, for our junior uh, uh, colleagues. The the uh, one of the problems is the rounding of the wound, so it, it makes it difficult to close if the wound is smaller and the, the surgeon tries to fit in the phaco probe and continues the surgery, and this could also lead to the wound burn. So avoid rounding the wound so as to be easier to close. Also, uh, just a, a small comment, in iris prolapse, it's usually easier for the surgeon to reposit from the paracentesis. Yeah. So. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Uh, okay, Sharma, uh, for excellent coverage. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Uh, I have one question to Dr. Safwan. Uh, uh, Dr. Safwan, suppose we are having, we didn't notice there is a dissement membrane detachment during the surgery and we found it in the next uh, day, for example, when we are just following the patient. What is the solution you are going to do? Dr. Safwan, you are mute. Can you please unmute yourself? And as uh, fast Dr. as Ahmed, as, as Dr. Sharma uh, presented in an, an excellent way, that uh, most of the cases we are seeing it and, and uh, uh, if, you, if you are allow me for the second case, just to, to share a few things. If you, if you stop the sharing, Dr. Yasin, Dr. Yasin, please, if you don't sh stop sharing, I will show you. Uh, 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 most of our cases, we are uh, 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 taking it and, and uh, see it through the uh, uh, intraoperatively, except uh, when we are uh, uh, suddenly surprised that we have a uh, second day. Um, Can uh, you do it fast, Dr. Safan? Yeah, you say I'm, you need only I'm within trying. 30 seconds, please. Yeah, I'm trying. If not, we can wait. keep it to the end if you are still going. No, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying, just. Okay, Dr. Safan, we can move to uh, Dr. Uh, just we keep this one, you will share it with us. Can you give it with talk, then later on you can show it at the okay. end. Okay, the, the issues, the point, the important point is that when we are we uh, retry to re-implant uh, the dissimates membrane that uh, we are seeing. First of all, the second day when we have corneal edema, we need to do uh, an anterior OCT. That's a very important issue. And when we discover that we have a dissimates membrane uh, detached, we need to refill the AC with the air. The filling is not from the paracentesis that we used. We need to go back and then fill the air because that will do an internal massage to the uh, dissimus membrane and it's it's uh, uh, reattach it in a beautiful way until the end and that's very okay. important thank you dr safwan dr amal if you have any comment please before we move and within 30 seconds please 
thank you, doctor, for a great presentation. And uh, I think the most important message that was delivered uh, that big disasters always start with small mistakes. So uh, whenever you have a decimate membrane detachment, you should stop immediately. And um, at the end, you should avoid hydrating the wound and uh, address the issue, uh, inject an air bubble in the anterior chamber, and don't wait and see, okay, the things will be okay. Because I have encountered patients who had DSEC done at the end after a decimate membrane detachment at the entry wound of a, a simple phaco surgery. So that's, that's a very important issue to be addressed. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amal. Okay, now we will move to the second uh, talks by dear friends, Dr. Yasin Dawood, and he is going to cover phaco emulsification iris related complications. Dr. Yasin. Good evening, Dr. Sharma. That was a, a tough act to follow. Thank you so much for all those wonderful videos and uh, always learn a lot from you. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, Dr. Amir, thank you so much uh, for the invitation and for the esteemed panelists. Um, uh, so I'm going to start with just a few videos. Uh, before I do, there are a lot of uh, iris problems that we encounter actually at a routine cataract surgery. It could be just the fact that, for example, you read a cataract, sinicha lysis, um, and uh, uh, sinicae anterior or posterior sinicae. It could be actually something that is congenital where the patient is born with, uh, 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 with iris coloboma. It could be actually something that was, uh, the patient was not born with, but we gave them uh, that during our cataract surgery, such a patient like this that was referred to me. It could be that the patient did it because uh, you know they were having a little bit of a fight with somebody else and uh, really ended up having significant iris trauma, or it could be that the surgeon themselves gave them this significant iris trauma. So based on the time that is allotted to us, we'll go over all of these cases. And there are some cases where the iris could be your friend and could be your friend and your adversary at the same time. So we'll just, uh, for the benefit of the time, we are just gonna go through uh, some of the surgical things that we're gonna do. Some of the tools that we have, uh, you know, we do have multiple different kinds of rings where they have different properties and we have iris hooks that has been uh, there and in existence for a long time. So I'll start with this uh, uveitic cataract in a young patient with a white cataract. And you can see that there are significant synechiae. Uh, with the significant synechiae, one of the things that you want to make sure is that as you are actually pulling a little bit, you definitely don't want to give the patient iridodialysis. And the best thing to do is mostly push rather than pull. And when you push, you are putting much less stress on the iris root. Uh, then once you are done, this is a patient actually, I decided not to do tripan blue because there's a lot of pigment uh, on the anterior capsule that I can actually follow to do my capsulotomy. I don't really recommend that in the vast majority of cases. I myself use tripan blue liberally. And I think it's reasonable to do that. And then you can proceed with your cataract surgery normal. As you can see, what I do for the iris hook, I insert one and initially I put viscose underneath the iris to elevate the iris up so that it's easy for me to implant my iris hook. And then I do it sequentially. I do my paracentesis all at once and then my iris hooks all at once and then clip them all at once. This patient has received an MA50BM it's a, just a three-piece IOL. It's my favorite one in, in patients who have uveitis or zonular problems in case I need to do something. This is a one-handed technique of removing your iris hook. And you can see just a tiny bit of a push. If you actually push it forward, let me just go back for two seconds. So if you actually push the iris hook forward a little bit, and then you have to tint up so that you can relieve it from the iris. And we just kind of got rid of the video. Um, and then what happens is you can actually remove it in just one hand. In that process, you have to be very careful that you are actually not capturing the iris or the capsule as you're coming out because you could cause uh, iris tear or capsular tear. So this is just a quick use of iris hooks. One of the things is you can use any technique to dilate the, uh, the pupil. However, if there are any zonular issues, it is actually better to use the hooks for multiple reasons. When you use the rings, they're gonna actually stand in your way, give you anterior resistance, which means things are gonna go back and that was, that's gonna cause more stress on your zonules. You can actually, as you'll see in the later one, I will be using the iris hooks to stabilize the capsule when I see that the capsule is weak. And uh, we, talk, we talked about the one-handed technique, you feel free to do the two-handed techniques. 
Now, one of the things that, you know, have gained in popularity in the United States, I don't know how, uh, how available it is overseas, is the Malugan ring, and there's the I ring, there's the Visitech ring, and now there's the Canabrava ring, so many different things. Basically, the basic technique is how can I increase the points of contacts of something against the iris? The Malugan ring is a polypropylene. The nice thing about it is, as you remember, the hooks, you usually use four, you may use five, but with the ring, you're actually having eight points of contact with the iris, which minimizes the stress on the four points of fixation, but also gives you a little bit of a rounder iris than a hook would. So I'm gonna show you a few videos uh, with what I do with these rings. The insertion is pretty simple. Sometimes you may be able to hook onto one of the eyelets into the iris. Sometimes if you are lucky, you may be able to put three. Uh, sometimes it's two, but it really does not matter. As long as you get the ring in with less trauma. Of course, these patients are under topical, so you have to tell them that you're gonna feel a little bit of a pain or discomfort now in a push. The second thing is that you have to recenter. Once you actually have done that, you have to recenter the, uh, the hooks. When you remove the ring, there are multiple ways. It's much easier to come from 180 degrees than sub-incisional. This technique is you just release one, you insert the Malugan inserter again, and you hook one of the eyelets. You don't have to hook the eyelet, but it's much simpler, less traumatic. And the moment it is parallel to the wound, you actually bring it out. You don't have to wait until all of the ring is actually inside of the barrel. In this case, you can see this is actually a femto case that I was doing, and the patient, uh, uh, and the patient uh, basically had uh, a constriction that I could not do with the viscoelastics or with the epinephrine. Uh, and now you can see that I'm really having a hard time actually positioning the ring into this iris. Now you can see the technique of me going 180 degrees away to just get access to uh, that eyelid to bring it forward. And then finally, you can see that I'll, I'll position the last one. This one is rather stubborn for some reason, but eventually you can get it. If, let me stop here for a second. If you have a hard time where the hook is just basically, sometimes you get the Malugan manipulator and the, um, and the iris tucked into the Malugan manipulator. You can just go with your second hand with any second instrument, Sinsky or your iris sweep, and you can actually dislodge it that way and that should work just fine. Now, how to remove this? We showed one technique. The second technique is the clockwise dial or counterclockwise dial where you'll see that I will release one, but then the moment you start dialing it, it releases by itself. That way the patient doesn't feel it. You are not traumatizing the eye very much. Again, once you have it parallel, you can relieve, uh, remove it. This is actually a case that was not done by me. As of yet, I'm not the surgeon. It's one of our surgeons. I was in our center and he's a fantastic surgeon, uh, glaucoma, uh, but, uh, somehow, as uh, he's putting a, this is pseudoexfoliation patient, and he's inserting the lens, and you'll see that as he's getting the lens in, sometimes these rings give you a hard time, and the ring goes behind the iris. The most important thing is you just have to breathe, you have to think what happened, and you have to reverse what you did. So now he basically called me up, and I'm, uh, this is now me coming in. And you just have to dial things to see what is going on, where are the eyelets, where are the haptics, and you have to be careful with your, you know, while you're coming out, not to capture any of your capsule. So here I'm like, okay, well, what's happened? It looks like the, hap the optic actually pushed the ring down, but sometimes you will actually find the haptic going through the eyelet. That's much more difficult to do, but it is still doable. And what I need to do is I need to dial this in a fairly atraumatic way. So I'll come across actually now with my Sinsky, I've already liberated these two eyelets and I'll try to push it, but you'll see that one of the third is coming out, but not the fourth. The fourth is rather stubborn. So now I just have to go pretty close to where I am here. And I have a, and instead of going blind, I wanna get a push-pull Kublin hook to see what's, what, what am I dealing with? I'm like, okay, good. So this is free. I'm not catching anything of the capsule and whatnot. I can go if I can and get the eyelet or lucky enough, it just came on its own. 
And now you can see handshake technique of me removing it. And that's basically what you do. And you just finish the case. So the Malugan ring is a fantastic ring, but any of the rings really do well. I usually prefer the seven millimeter there. They come in 6.25 millimeters because I do a pop and chop technique. One of the pearls is if you really do have a significant floppy IR syndrome, you can actually use the ring and put what we have mypol or myostat, which is acetylcholine or carbacol, and that will constrict the iris around the ring and that will stabilize it so it doesn't come out of your wound. So that's one pearl. The second thing is if you really consider using any of these rings, you have to watch out for retained lens fragments because they actually go underneath the iris. The iris is floppy, so their segments are gonna come with your fluidics. But if there is a ring, they're gonna get stuck until, and then you'll see them the next day, and then you have to take the patient back to the operating room. Uh, the insert or dislodge, it's easier to go from 180 degrees. You have your main incision, you have paracentesis. It's easier to go 180 degrees than to struggle with it in the sub-incisional. Now that we have moved from those things, let's talk about iridodialysis, dialysis, iris defect repair, pupilloplasty, IOL fixation to the iris. So this case is actually, the iris is not a problem. The iris becomes your friend. Um, and this is iris sutured IOL. Uh, you basically fold the lens. This lens is about uh, six millimeters optic. It has 10 millimeter, uh, 10 uh, degrees posterior angulation. You fold it in a mustache technique or in a palm tree uh, technique. You have to be very careful with this, that this trailing haptic has to go first because these are PMMA haptics, otherwise they'll, they'll break. Then you, as you are opening the lens, as you are unfolding it, you want to make sure that it does not snap back and go back. So you put any second instrument to hold the optic up while the haptics are getting underneath the iris. And then you have any of CIF4 uh, uh, or CTC needle. CTC is because it's curved, STC it's a straight. And then you just have to go to the mid peripheral iris and get very small nibble of the iris where you are passing through the iris underneath the haptic through the iris, through the cornea. And then you'll see that I am doing the same exact thing on the other side. You can go through the cornea or you can go through your main corneal incision. The most important two things, you wanna to go to the mid periphery so that you don't have a cat eye appearance. Then you have the paracentesis where the haptic and the suture are meeting right here. You take one end of the suture out, you hold the second end, and then you externalize both of them. And you can use a mechanical suture technique or you can really use a seeps or not. I don't recommend the fourth row pupilloplasty because I don't think it's tight enough to withhold the uh, weight of the lens in these scenarios. But and the, now you want to really go down and cinch it down on your 311 so that it doesn't dislodge. Then you can just cut it short or long. It doesn't matter as long as you don't cut your uh, knot itself. And then you basically with the Sinsky, you actually will push one way and then you'll push towards the haptic optic junction right here with the suture. And that could be that the iris is your friend in these surgeries. Here is actually a 32 year old uh, uh, teacher and she doesn't have much of a, uh, uh, much of a lens problem as far as uh, cataract, but you can see that she has significant zonular problems. This iris is not pharmacologically dilated. She actually, this is her iris from the trauma. She came in with documented pressure of 50 because the lens was actually intermittently moving forward. So I removed the lens and I'm like, okay, this is before the Imani technique and the glue dye well at that time was still new. Uh, and I was like, okay, well, what can I do to fix both the problems for this patient? She has weak zonular support. She's still rather young and the iris is a pretty, um, dilated. So you can see me tugging on it. You have to be very careful as you're coming in that you do not cause iris, uh, iris root di dialysis. Sometimes you may see some heme, but you'll see that I put the lens in. Remember, I said take as little piece of the iris as possible with this technique. However, because we want to make this iris smaller, you can see me going and taking a nice chunk of the iris to actually bring it together because this iris is so dilated. And I use the same exact technique in the interest of time. You will see that I am finishing and you will see the beautiful iris coming down. The lens is already replaced. The lens is supported 
and the pupil is fairly round and she's doing very well with it. Um, it. This incision, by the way, is a four and a half millimeter. So this is a technique of iris suturing through a mechanical uh, suture. And this is the patient, I think one week actually after the surgery. Uh, this is uh, iris coloboma, the same exact technique. Uh, this is a patient who came in for cataract surgery and they had coloboma. You have to be very careful because usually there's zonular coloboma, but in this patient, actually, you can see that the zonules are very reasonable. I'm, having, I'm not having any problem with the lens being decentered or with the lens being pushed one way or the other. So I feel very comfortable uh, with uh, the zonules that I'm like, okay, this is just going to be a routine cataract surgery. Uh, but I have had patients who come in with, you know, all the way coloboma from the iris to the zonules to the lens to uh, all the way to the retina. And then you finish, uh, you, you do the surgery. I usually like the pop and chop technique. You can easily do it within 5.5 millimeters, um, uh, actually, uh, capsulotomy. And once I am done with the cataract, again, I'll pass it through. So this is, in a way, the iris is bystander, but the patient is photophobic, the patient's having problems. I hold the iris with a 23 gauge forceps, um, retina in the grasping forceps will work, or any of your uh, uh, micro forceps, and you will see that you pass it. You can go through the same exact technique. Then you just to bring the sutures out, and you just have to go, and what I use for this is actually, I use a Lester hook. It does much better than a, Sinsky hook because it has a bulb on it on the end. So it actually holds the uh, thread as it is coming out. And you should never go into your angle blindly. So you can actually get an iris sweep, go in, bring the uh, thread out to your view so that you can bring it. And you can see that the iris actually approximates really nicely. Uh, you can do seeps or you can do fourth row pupilloplasty, but whatever technique you do, uh, this is a very convenient and very quick and uh, you know things that are available in routine cataract surgery. Uh, this is the same thing, uh, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna pass on it because uh, this is a patient referred to me uh, and I do the same one. I'm gonna show this surgery actually. Uh, so this is a patient that came with a trauma with a little bit small iridodialysis uh, and with a little bit of zonulopathy in that area. And the patient was like, I don't wanna wear glasses also. I'm like, I can't promise you anything. The most important thing with iridodialysis is you really want to isolate it first because this, you know, this doesn't have any counter traction. It's going to be flabby the whole time during your cataract surgery. So I use two hooks in this area to really isolate it. And then I use five hooks. So it's like a house shape rather than a round shape. And I basically start doing my cataract. The cataract is uneventful, uh, but I am worried about the uh, lens itself just because this area, uh, you know, looking at it in the slit lamp, I was not very happy with it. Uh, so in this case, I'll just remove the cataract. Uh, and, so yeah, I think can we fasten this one because we already over two minutes or three minutes about. Oh, really? So, okay. Yeah. So I'll show the last technique then, uh, which is a Hoffman pocket. And in the Hoffman pocket, what you will do is you can actually have a 350 microns and you have to go through the same corneal incision. This is an STC6 needle. It's a straight, you can curve it if you want. And for this part, you're gonna have just a, a, the smallest part of the iris, and you're gonna come through the Hoffman pocket. You can use a 27 gauge needle from the outside to bring it in. And that has become my favorite technique rather than just going blindly through this. So you take it out and just 30 more seconds. So this basically, you have to make sure you go through the same exact paracentesis port. You could get a cannula to actually externalize and get the needle through it to make sure you are going through this. Because if you have any corneal tissue, your thread is gonna be actually stuck here and then you have to redo the whole thing again or try to rescue it. So the, you can actually get it. And again, you want to get the smallest part of the iris so that this does not peak. And when you get it, you have both sides now, you'll see that I'm pulling, then you can get Sinsky hook, externalize these, you know, you'll see one, then you'll externalize the second, 350 depth, back about three millimeters, because you want to give yourself a good room. You have these two, you, you do them three, one, one, and basically the iris looks fantastic. 
And I will stop with that. You can use this type, the same exact technique with this, uh, with this part. And eventually you do, uh, the patient basically does even well with big problems, with iris problems. So the same exact technique, just use it four times around. Thank you so much for your attention. I'm happy to take your questions at the end. Thank you very much, Dr. Yassin. Very nice and excellent presentation. presentation. Excellent video showing the techniques that you are using to uh, repair the iris. So we don't have a time. So maybe we'll keep the discussion about this presentation maybe to the end of the uh, our uh, sessions. Sure. So without any delay, we will go now directly to the third presentation. It will be by Dr. Zena al muhtasib PECO Emulsification, Anterior Capsule Related Complications. Dr. Zena. Sounds great. Thank you again so much uh, for having me on. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Amri and, and to the committee for having me speak. So I'll get right into it. And I actually have an Thank alarm for, for, for 12 minutes. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Okay, great. So I'm going to talk about capsule related uh, complications during phaco emulsification. So I'll talk about how to perform a good capsulorexis, when to use tripan blue, discuss the little maneuver, and some difficulties. Um, with anterior capsular fibrosis, white cataracts, and then talking about some complicated uh, cases in terms of trauma. So really the best way to deal with complications is to prevent them. So you wanna do a very good preoperative history. You wanna make sure uh, to understand, are there previous trauma? Is there a poor red reflex? Are these patients have a previous surgery, ocular surgery, which changes things? Um, and then, of course, be aware if patients have risk of radialization, if this is a patient with a shallow anterior chamber, mature white cataracts, pediatric cataracts, and then, of course, uh, zonular laxity. So to perform a good anterior capsulotomy, you want to make sure to deepen the anterior chamber with OBD. I like use, puncturing the capsule with a cystotome and then creating a flap and then using your trata forceps. It's important to hold the capsule in the correct location and do shearing. So you're about two to three clock hours away. Residents, when they start, you wanna keep grabbing and grabbing. The least amount of times you grab, the better it is. And then you wanna make a size between four to six, ideally around five millimeters to avoid uh, PCO formation and then capsular phimosis. As you know, the zonules are actually wanting in the periphery to create radialization of your capsule. And that can be magnified if you underfill with OVD or if they're shallow chamber, if the, or if the lens is anteriorly located. So you gotta understand there's forces that want you to radialize such as vitreous pressure and then uh, decreasing anterior chamber. So when to use tripan blue. Anytime there's a patient with a trauma, poor red reflex, it's a dense cataract. Um, and then of course, loose zonules. I staff a lot at the county hospital and the little maneuver was one of the best techniques that saved us from JCRS in 2006. And I'll show it in video form. But basically, if you start feeling that your capsorexis is wanting to go out, you want to flap, put back your flap, and then pull towards the center, but don't pull too much, and then reorient the, the flap. Some people make go to the center, and then it cuts off completely. So let's watch a video. This is one of our, my residents operating. As you can see, the actual capsule starts wanting to radialize. So you can see here, I tell them to flap it back. So that's really important in terms of that. And then you wanna to pull to the center, but not too much because you only wanna change the trajectory of the capsule. You don't want to you know, bring it all the way to the center. So again, this is slowed. As you can see, I'm using the, the, the BSS bottle to tell them where to go, but basically you're reorienting. And sometimes it's a lot harder to do. This is one of our other residents. Again, what's nice is that they did not underfill the anterior chamber. But what you can see here is, again, when you do too much with the cystotome, you're doing too much maneuvering, you can start losing where your capsule is. And this is a case, you can see that this is a dense lens that he probably should have put tripian, especially when you're starting out, it's so much easier. And so again, he's struggling, he's grabbing, and it's hard to tell here, but what's happening is it's going out completely here, almost to the periphery, to the equator. So I take over 
and spent some time with the OVD cannula to see what I'm doing. And I blindly do the technique of the little maneuver where I'm going to the center. And I, you can see you want to grab as close as you can to the edge of the capsule, go to the center, and then reorient your utratas and just continue your capsular rexus uh, normally after that. So it's really important to know, just trust it, just pull it straight and you'll be able to save it. So let's talk a little bit about doing a rexus in anterior capsular fibrosis patients. So I like using um, Tripan Blue, putting in OVD, lifting up the, the iris off of the capsule and being very careful when you do that not to tear the capsule. So I go with my cannula underneath. One key pearl is use the cystotome around the area of fibrosis. Don't try to make the opening in the actual capsular fibrosis. So you wanna incorporate it into your anterior capsulotomy. So again, you're going around um, and then just removing it and you do it all around that area of capsular fibrosis. And then you're able to uh, kind of proceed with the surgery. Another pearl that I like is sometimes I like restaining with tripan even after I do the anterior capsulotomy. And the reason for that is you want to see that capsulotomy um, during the whole time because sometimes it's just not, you don't get as much of a good stain. And what if you're not sure? Have, has it been, you know, again, circular? Has it been uh, around? So in terms of the interest of time, we'll go kind of to the next case. This patient also had zonular loss. So in these cases, again, I go in with my cannula. Sometimes I have to use a needle. You want to, as I'm injecting OVD, I'm lifting. Um, and then uh, Dr. Yasindo did a great job about discussing kind of these tough cases. And I agree with him. Sometimes it's very hard where you have this remnant pigment on the anterior capsule and you can easily cause a tear in the anterior capsule. So again, I remove the OVD, I go in, I restain with tripan, and then I want to puncture the capsule in the location that there's no pigment, and I wanna make sure to remove the pigment as I'm doing my capsular rexus technique here. And then again, um, I make sure to go in the orientation, in the circular way, and make sure to remove this, um, this fibrotic membrane and that's remnant pigment. And again, I restain because it's very hard to tell <coughs> if there's areas where um, there's a tear in the capsule in these cases. Um, and then even if you're doing a triple procedure as I do here, you can still use the uh, Mayugan ring in terms of uh, opening up the iris. And again, when you have this surprising um, very significant caps, uh, capsular fibrosis, it's a little bit harder because you don't have the OVD pushing down, right? And you have the lens anterior. So that capsule wants to radialize regardless. You want to make that capsule as small as possible. And if you look, I'm orienting my capsular rexus technique to the center of the eye. Basically, I'm doing a little maneuver for the whole process. So I'm not going circular. I'm basically just aiming towards the center um, of the eye here, as you can see, just basically little maneuver going forward, little maneuver going forward. And that's really the technique to be able to uh, perform this capsular rexus here. Um, a lot harder, obviously, open sky, but again, it's all the same uh, principles that you utilize. And then in this case, we got lucky enough to be able to have a round uh, capsular rexus. So just remember and try to incorporate that fibrosis into the rexus and it's okay to restain. Tripan blue is your best friend. And then use OVD and lift up the cannula. Um, so let's talk a little bit about these white cataracts where you're worried about Argentinian flag sign. I like utilizing a 27 or 25 gauge half inch needle and making sure to decompress. I only make two pairs of centesis, fill with tripan, fill with OVD, and then I make use the needle for a different entry. I don't make my wound. And the reason for that, um, I'll show you why. But in this case, you really need to, I shouldn't have aspirated as much because you can easily puncture the posterior capsule. But again, in this case, um, when you do remove some of that, just remember that in the periphery, you can have some remnant uh, white cataract that's liquefied and it can still want to radialize. 
And also when you pull out too much, you, sometimes you can fill the bag so that you can still be able to do the rexus. And the reason, again, I stopped doing my wound is look at this case. So paracentesis wound done, going in to decompress as soon as I touch the anterior capsule, you get that um, Argentinian flag sign. And I think part of it is you don't want any openings. And sometimes that can happen. Just there's just so much tense, tenseness from it. You can still put a one piece lens. You can still remove this capsule. Uh, there's a little bit of, um, I, I don't like that there's, uh, you don't have the visual access open. So I open up that rexus a little bit more, but the patient can do very well. So what about patients with trauma with anterior capsular violation that's already there? Again, use Tripan Blue. You use OVD to kind of see what's going on here. This is a seven-year-old status post open globe repair. I love using iris hooks when I'm not sure what's going on. And then I want to open, you know, there's a lot of opening in the anterior capsule. So I just aspirate. So again, I can see where is the anterior capsule? Where is the posterior capsule? And you can make paracentesis in any location that makes it easier for you. Don't have to be kind of your typical orientation. So in this case, I use a paracentesis in a different orientation to help me and bimanual irrigation aspiration is phenomenal in these cases. You can see there's a big, large U-shape anterior capsular fibrosis. So I make a cut there because that's gonna be in the visual axis. This is a young patient. I also wanna do a primary posterior capsulotomy because I don't like putting three-piece lenses in these kids um, primarily. I like to do optic capture. Um, and then also they're gonna need a YAG. A lot of research from India shows a patient with traumatic cataract that's a child will get PCO very quickly. So again, the forces are very different when you're trying to do a posterior capsulotomy. It's almost like doing open sky pediatrics in general. Again, you're aiming much more towards the center than circumferentially. Um, and then in this case, we were able to do a, a, a primary posterior capsulotomy. I put in the three-piece lens and then basically just opti optic captured it. Um, I put in a triumph some alone just to make sure that there wasn't any um, vitreous around the zonules. I'll skip this case similar because of time. Um, I won't really go into much about posterior capsulotomies, uh, posterior PC tears, uh, because our next speaker will do it. I just wanted to show one case kind of how to approach it from an anterior segment surgeon. This is one of our residents. Sometimes these soft lenses are much more difficult to, to, to remove than our a little bit denser lenses. They're not able to really grab that. Um, and as you can see, the phaco is, you're kind of, they're phacoing without really seeing what's behind uh, the posterior capsule. And in this case, at this point is where I noticed that they actually have a large posterior capsular tear. The anterior capsule is intact. Um, and an elongated, but then there's remnant capsule. So just a couple of points on doing uh, a anterior vitrectomy. You never want to remove your instruments until you put OVD, as you can see here. It's nice with the newer vitrectors, they go through the paracentesis. You can turn off and on the cutter. So initially you do the uh, anterior vitrectomy, use triamcimolone, and then once you've removed the vitreous from the anterior chamber, you can cut keep the cutter off, but still use the vitrectomy to do irrigation aspiration of this cortical material. And again, never remove the instruments without putting OVD in the eye. You never want the chamber to shallow because more vitreous can actually uh, enter. Uh, and again, I restain with triamcimolone. It's also anti-inflammatory. It's really great. Here I put in OVD. Sometimes I use an iris hook, make sure that there's no vitreous strands. And then what do you do in terms of the lens? I like doing uh, the three-piece lens, which we showed in that previous case. Um, and then optic capture is always better. So these are some of the pointers that I talked about. I like using my stat at the end. Um, and then I just wanna spend about a minute to talk about what types of lenses to actually put into uh, different patients. So if you have an anterior capsular tear, but the posterior capsular is intact, you can put a, a single piece acrylic um, and then rotate the haptics and make sure that it's perpendicular to the tear, similar to the case I showed prior. But make sure never to let the chamber shallow, constrict the pupil, and suture the temporal incision. What if you have a posterior capsular tear, but an intact capsular rexus? The ideal situation would be a three-piece IOL with optic capture. It's much better to utilize optic capture. 
uh, can play single piece in the bag with small tears, but I, I try to avoid that. Um, and then you don't have to adjust the power, which is more important in, in uh, lar larger power lenses. Um, and why is it important to do optic capture? One is the three-piece lenses that we utilize in the U.S. have relatively short haptic lens. So especially in long eye patients or large diameter anterior chamber, it's going to keep bumping. And especially in younger patients, it can cause UGG. Um, and then also it's nice to do optic capture because of the no change in IOL power. A great study showing that it's important to avoid decentration with optic capture. Uh, most importantly, never put a one piece in the sulcus as we know can have all of these complications, secondary glaucoma, hyphema. What about if you have an AC and a PC tear? If, if there's not enough support, you know, sulcus is an option. I don't like doing that unless I need to. Um, and so the, this is from a chapter I wrote about um, what to do in these cases. So as you can see, my preference is going now the Imani intrascleral haptic fixation for those cases, uh, but there are multiple different options. And so in general, get comfortable with different techniques, uh, discuss with the patient, talk about these potential outcomes and just be prepared it will happen to you if you operate. Thanks again for, for having me uh, speak. Thank you very much, Dr. Zena, for an excellent presentation. You cover most of the points. I think there is many questions, maybe, but we will keep it also because we already over the time. So we will move to the uh, fourth presentation by my dear friend, Dr. Ahmed al -Barti. He's a vitreoretinal surgeon, and he is going to give his opinion from point of vitreoretinal surgeon about, and his title of the topic, Does and Doesn't, in anterior vitrectomy. Dr. Ahmed. Ahmed, you are with me. <clears throat> Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mohammed, for the uh, kind invitation. It's a pleasure for me to be here today with the uh, these distinguished speaker and the panelist. So uh, my talk today is about the uh, what should we do and shouldn't do in anterior vitrectomy. What happened if the vitreous loss and do you manage it uh, properly? So uh, actually, the story starts uh, before we should know our target uh, while dealing with vitreous loss uh, during cataract surgery. Also, another important point: it expect complication before happening preoperatively. Uh, intraoperatively, another important uh, point is to recognize early some warning sign I'm going to discuss that it gives you an idea that something wrong is going on and you have to stop at certain point. Uh, for sure, the technique and the setting should be known and uh, finally the postoperative care. So if you start with the target, what's our target in doing anterior vitrectomy in complicated cataract surgery? The most important point or aim is to prevent intraoperative vitrostraction or traction of the vitreous during surgery. And definitely the post-operative vitreous uh, traction or adhesion to the wound or the side port, this should be avoided and maintain a normal tensile globe at the end and definitely to protect uh, cornea and the telium or iris or capsule from any other damage and definitely remove any remaining lens or fragments or, or, or cortex. So, uh, expect complications. So I think I think it's very important while examining the patient or evaluating the patient preoperatively, uh, we have a list of some problematic eye that it could have problem during surgery, like this list. So one of the signs, also early signs, that it gives you an idea that this the news this could be weak during doing the initial uh, uh, capsule exercise, the tail and the capsule system, you find these uh, wrinkles here. So it gives you an idea that this the news could be uh, weak. So you should take care during the surgery. So what I prefer actually in those kind of patients to expect complication, better to give a block rather than topical anesthesia. I know most of the anterior segment surgeons, they are doing it topically, but if you have some case like that, uh, it could have a complication, better to give a block to avoid adding anesthesia during the trachectomy uh, for because the patient at that time maybe have some pain or positive pressure or something like that. So I prefer to do an initially peripartial anesthesia. Uh, for sure, you have to keep the protective instrument standby and uh, book additional time for a bit and have a buck implant, which some, sometimes also very important. Uh, what are the early signs and warning signs? This is a very important point I want to highlight here. Uh, if some during FACO, you can f see some suddenly pupillary pounds or change the pupil size. 
Another point is the sudden deepening of the anterior chamber without any reason. So it could be the sign that the posterior capsule is open and you didn't notice that. Uh, another important also point is the, the flow is lost with the lens material is not coming to you. So you be, could be something blocking there. A very another uh, point and point on the FACO efficiency. You are doing FACO and it's not efficient. So maybe the FACO blocked by prolapsed vitreous and you notice that, and this is very uh, dangerous if you continue with FACO and there is a vitreous inside the probe. So if you find unexplained loss of FACO <clears throat> efficiency during surgery, you should think about this. Also spidering the bacterial capsule, and this is very uh, obvious for all of us, tilted of the nucleus equator, and finally the whole bunch sign. I just want to show, uh, uh, for sooner is a better as we will agree about that. This is just a video uh, to show you the, uh, I don't know, oh, sorry. Uh, there is some delay in the, hello? Yes, no. yes doctor. Yes, doctor. Oh, okay, let me try now. Yes, okay. The video, I'm not sure. Do you see the video working or no? No, it's, yes, working. it's working now. Yeah, yeah now it's yeah. working now. Okay, so during doing FACO or doing shopping, as it is not my surgery. There's a, there's a video to show that. So sometimes you find this sign: the, the the lens, the tilt, the nucleus equator tilted up. So I think you should stop at that time because this is a sign. It could be a sign of a capsule thing, and that's why I've seen here in the surgery the lens dropped. Another sign uh, uh, I told you about is the whole bunch sign. Yes, as you can see here, usually this happened during uh, cracking or during doing the initial guttering uh, using a high vacuum. This is not, this is, again, this is the, I don't know, the, ah, there is some delay, I'm sorry for that, I don't know why. Anyway, there is another sign, let's call it whole bunch sign. Usually it happened, as I mentioned, during the cracking and using high vacuum in a relatively soft uh, nucleus. You can see this hole while doing uh, uh, the initial stage of the FACO. So if this happens, it's usually preferred not to uh, continue the FACO this time, preferably to remove the other fragment, the other half, and keep this quadrant to the end with this hole inside. And also you can add some viscoelastic behind to avoid any uh, extension of the posterior uh, capsular hole there. As you can see, this is gone initially. So, uh, Technique is very important because uh, uh, it's very important to give another anesthesia if there's something happening. Sedation also is important. The most important uh, point, as Dr. Zainab also illustrated in his talk, the do not let the anterior chamber collapse. It's very important because uh, once happen and you find there is a drop in the nucleus or vitreous loss, do not pull the fecal probe out of the eye suddenly and go to just position one, which is only irrigation, irrigation and then inject of a lot of amount of viscoelastic, dispersive viscoelastic uh, to revitalize the AC, and then you can get out of the fecal probe and better to close tight water future. I will dictate you. This is how it happened. If you have a low, low pressure in the anterior chamber, the vitreous will go, but if you revitalize the anterior chamber, you prevent more vitreous prolapse. This is just to show you the video how uh, this could be done. This in the upper video, I'm sorry, there is some delay and in, in the playing the video. You can see the surgeon here, once he dropped the nucleus, he get out with both instruments suddenly, as you can see here, and there is a sudden a collapse of the AC. If you look this proper manager for this case, uh, okay, uh, this is the, the surgeon in this case, he did it properly. As you see here, he was doing FACO and when the problem, the lens dropped, uh, let's go faster a bit. As you see here, he's trying to catch a lot of fish, but it dropped, so he didn't, he get out with the shopper, don't get out with the fake irrigation still there. But with the other hand, both of huge amount of, uh, be generous in doing a lot of dispersive viscoelastic to normalize and prevent more vitreous relapse. And then you can uh, uh, easily go out and you can see that there's no collapse of the SC. So this is a proper way how to avoid more vitreous prolapse in the interior chamber after vitreous loss. So the technique and the, uh, uh, during doing the trectomy, we, we, may, we need to reduce the vitro retraction. So we should use the highest cut rate available in your machine with low flow irrigation and low vacuum to remove the vitreous. Uh, again, we need to know that we are doing just anterior vitrectomy. It was not 
we are, we are not planning to remove the whole vitreous. We're just removing the vitreous material chamber. So use the high cut rate with the low flow and low vacuum. Uh, for protective mode, if you are going to, for the vitreous, you should uh, IA cut, which is cutting first and then aspiration. For lens fragment, you use aspiration first and then cutting. And this is how to show the fit the position. Uh, also, try and seal on. I think it's a very important uh, 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 trick or tip, as Dr. Zainab also, I think, is strategic that to show you uh, using trims, and I think it's a very uh, a privilege, you know, because sometimes you have a small vitreous strand you can lift behind uh, while doing a, a vitrectomy, especially if you have some corneal edema, so you can miss some small vitreous strands. So I believe better to visualize, to stain it with uh, trim silone to make sure that you really re remove all the vitreous strands in the anterior chamber. What is the approach? The approach we have two main approaches to do anterior vitrectomy. The paracentesis anterior vitrectomy, which is most commonly doing, uh, being done using the, most of the surgeon, and uh, the partial blana anterior vitrectomy. Personally, uh, I believe the I prefer the partial blana, not being a VR surgeon, but I think it's there is some rationale for doing that. I think it's make more sense anatomically, and also it minimizes attraction uh, on the vitreous base. And it's more efficient as, as you are calling a vitreous back home rather than doing from the anterior uh, uh, chamber. And also you can move all the attachment without too much sweeping and minimize vitreous and attraction forces. The other approach is the, uh, I don't know if there is some delay. This is how to do that. Is, sorry, this is for the uh, partial blana and this is for the uh, uh, paracentesis approach. And uh, a new trick here is the, to use a separate incision for the vitrectomy. Do not use the vitrectomy for the main incision. Just to show you this uh, video for the parts of planner uh, approach, I just show you, uh, it's an easy done. I think it's not, be, to not be a, a VR surgeon to do that. I think uh, it's, uh, anyone can do that because most of the vitrectomy machine, uh, sorry, the FACO machine now, the anterior vitrectomy back have a troker, so you can uh, uh, do it and uh, partial blana is not uh, exclusive for v VR surgeons. So I think it's, this will make more sure that you remove most of it. And also you have easy access to the lens material uh, or cortex. You can remove it easier rather than the anterior, uh, the paracentesis approach. The paracentesis approach we already discussed it during the, uh, uh, the this is what I mentioned about the separate, use separate incision for the vitrective rather than doing the three to avoid leak. If you if you go if you look at this in the left hand side video, if you use a separate uh, incision or use the vitrectomy or use a paracentesis, you have minimal leak here. Rather than if you use a, a, a vitrectomy probe through the main incision, yes, you can see here a lot of leak and the EC is uh, unstable and more vitreous will come. So I prefer to uh, do the use the side port for the fake over rather than an incision. Uh, setting, I think another important point, what happened if you have some fragment fall in the vitreous, do not chase it, it's very important. Do not trying to grasp it with the fecal probe. It's very uh, dangerous because you might induce retinal tear by pulling in the retina and you have leave it behind. Do, don't do a lot of uh, maneuver using the fecal probe. Just what if it is it's fall down, don't chase it or try to do that. It's very, as you see here in this cartoon, it's very dangerous because Using a phaco probe in a vitreous, it's very dangerous because of the ultrasound, and you can easily uh, induce a peripheral tear, even big tear. Uh, sponge vitrectomy, definitely, I think we should all agree there is no rule now because it's really induced a very excessive uh, traction on the vitreous space. Uh, for the um, final step, for sure, you have to remove the residual cortex using the uh, setting, as we mentioned before, ion implantation. We have a list of uh, options as Dr. Zainab also illustrated. So you choose whatever you want. Uh, finally, uh, you, you know, people is important because you want to make sure that the lens is uh, an iron in place and also there is no uh, pupil peak, no vitreous strand there. And finally, you have to make a, a, a tight, watertight closure of the human incision. So post-operative care is very important. You can consider intratribatic and say it is important because we have a, 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 a high incidence of cytomacular edema. Uh, better to refer the patient for retinal vitreous for just for retinal examination. Uh, also, a very important point is to educate your patient or disclosure so that something happened and we manage it. 
and you should, uh, uh, if you have any symptoms of floaters or um, uh, flashes of light, you can come easily. So it's a very important to disclose to your patients what's happened. So to conclude, there is a list of something we should do, uh, like the knowing, especially know the target or early recognition of the warning signs, predict complication, the technique, post-operative care, and educate your patient. On the other hand, we shouldn't panic, just uh, do not pull out the fake or broke suddenly, reform or keep the pressure inside the EC uh, very informed to avoid more vitreous rehab, do not chase fragments or trying to do FACO while I'm not sure there is some vitreous there, do not do spongy vitrectomy. I think the talk on message with this comprehensive strategy to deal with vitreous loss and to be get ready in advance for loss of vitreous, this uh, treating the patient with logic and care, I think this will lead to uh, achieving optimal outcome even if you have complicated cases. Thank you so much. I hope that I stick to my time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Excellent presentation. And uh, yes, you are have your time, 15 minutes. Uh, so we will have uh, also the last talk, I think, because it will be better now to discuss all the things at the end. So we'll have now Dr. Uh, Saad. He will give us a talk about endophthalmitis and he give a title about uh, to say that uh, both uh, operative endophthalmitis, the untold story. Go start. Great, thank you. Thank you, Muhammad. Um, can you hear me and can you see the slides? Yes. Yeah. Great, okay, thank you. Well, thank you for the invitation. It's always great um, to be back uh, with you. Um, always, uh, uh, you know, um, distinguished speakers, wonderful uh, panel. Um, um, since I'm a vitreo retinal surgeon, uh, I feel like a min minority among all the anterior segment surgeons around today. So I'm going to um, uh, uh, do my best to be careful on what I say, but um, I choose to speak about this. Um, it's a topic that we don't usually like to speak about. Uh, people do not believe it will happen to them, uh, but uh, trust me, uh, if you are doing um, um, FACO, and uh, even if you're the best uh, FACO surgeon, one day you will notice and see these uh, uh, cases. Uh, so without further ado, I'll just... Uh... Okay, so let's agree on a few things at the beginning. This is a bad disease. Um, you know, endophthalmitis is rare, but it's a site uh, threatening uh, complication. These patients can sometimes end up losing uh, their eye. The chances are very low. We're talking one in a thousand, and it involves inflammation of both the anterior and posterior segment. I think the most important step is the early uh, recognition, the rapid uh, treatment and initiation of therapy. If you do that, um, you have a good chance of saving patient vision. I'll try uh, to see if I can convince you of um, you know, uh, earlier surgery for these patients. Um, different ways of classifying endophthalmitis. Our interest today is to talk about the post-cataract endophthalmitis, but you can get endophthalmitis after any intraocular surgery. The, incidence is a bit higher after secondary eye wells. Now, when you're doing cataract, the chances are higher with clear cornea. And obviously, if you develop any of the complication that has been mentioned, specifically the posterior capsular um, uh, rents or tears. Uh, if you look at the incidence of endophthalmitis over years, you will notice that, you know, back in the early 90s, it was like 2%. And now <clears throat> in 2009, it's almost 0.03%. And in a very recent uh, article that I unfortunately don't have citation for, uh, I think it was from China, it showed that uh, the incidence is even less. Um, now, the most common organisms are the um, um, uh, gram-positive cocci, mainly the staph and strip, and if you're unlucky, you might get a gram-negative um, organism. Now, it's very important to um, um, uh, realize or identify the risk factors, specifically uh, preoperatively and of notice is infection of the lacrimal drainage and I still remember this patient was referred to me for cataract surgery and he had a, a, a you know um, a nasolacrimal duct filled with pus I did advise him to fix it first but unfortunately he went somewhere else he did his FACO and he comes back after a week with endophthalmitis so definitely you want to make sure you treat chronic blepharitis you examine your patients preoperatively. Intraoperatively, if you um, get prolonged surgery, if you develop any of the complications mentioned by uh, wonderfully by the previous uh, speakers, 
uh, definitely you want to be careful. One of the things I noticed from our anterior segment um, colleagues is that um, I don't know what's, what is the problem with the, with the corneal sutures. They don't like to put corneal sutures. Um, you know, if, if you develop a posterior capsular rent, I, I strongly advise, or if you get a, a, a vitreous into the AC, definitely put a suture. Um, but I, I, I think there's, it has to do with the ego, I think, of the anterior segment surgeon. And postoperatively, definitely, if you get a wound leak or vitreous incarceration, you would like to be careful. Now, endophlegmitis is a clinical diagnosis. These patients come with symptoms, usually within one week of the surgery, and you have to have high index of suspicion, specifically for your training residents and fellows, you know, younger ophthalmologists. Uh, pain is very important, but I would show you a case where the patient had practically no pain. Uh, loss of vision is very important, redness, discharge, and the hallmark of their examination is the um, extensive anterior chamber reaction, the hypobion and uh, the fibrin formation. And then you do the B-scan and you see the classic uh, uh, picture of the uh, vitreous opacity. Now, once you've diagnosed the case, you would like to consider an, a, a vitreous tap, a plus or minus an AC tap. And that is extremely important to be done uh, as soon as you can. And you know, when I do that, I usually call my microbiology and I make sure they uh, expect the sample and they give me an immediate gram stain and then we follow the culture and sensitivity. Uh, in the same setting, <clears throat> you want to prepare the patients for intravitreal injections. Um, I routinely use steroids with antibiotics, but some people uh, may not use it. I think steroids have a major role to control the intraocular inflammation that is very significant in these cases. And um, you know there are different antibiotics that have been used. We use vancomycin um, and and uh, ancestazidime or amikacin, uh, followed by topical um, steroids, usually fortified, very frequent drops. Now, as far as um, uh, the use of systemic antibiotics and systemic steroid, this is um, controversial. Now, um, what has changed from the time of the endophthalmitis vitrectomy study? I would say everything has changed. EVS has been done 30 years ago, and it's very hard for me to convince me that we should still follow the study. Uh, I, I just don't think it's applicable. EVS was done at the time where vitrectomy techniques were different. We did not have the uh, suture list, the smaller gauge vitrectomy, the better cutters, the better visualization. So um, I think um, in my practice, I think um, it, it is different now. Uh, I'm not going to go over the study because you're all aware of the study and how did it classify patients according to vision. Uh, but I think there is major benefit of doing earlier and aggressive vitrectomy, uh, including uh, debulking the vitreous, removing the uh, bacteria and the toxin, improving the visualization, delivering the antibiotics. Yes, it is a procedure that has complication, but I think in the era of micro um, um, uh, instruments, uh, we're talking now 27 gauge uh, technique. I think the complications are minimum. Now, I think in 2021, I think the picture is different. Studies have shown, and there is a, a, a growing body of evidence from the recent literature that earlier uh, surgery might have uh, better techniques. And I'll see if I can convince you by showing you a couple of cases, but I think for the interest of time, I'll just show one case. So th this is an elderly gentleman who uh, come to us, a uh, 70-year-old heavy smoker with chest issues, and uh, he's known hypertensive and diabetic, uh, and diabetic with loss of vision in both eyes, very dense cataract in his right eye with light perception vision, and an equally dense cataract in the other eye with 2200 vision, seen by the anterior segment people, uh, underwent an uneventful fake emulsification. You can see the pre and post um, up pictures, his cornea was pristine, uh, very mild cellular reaction, improving visual acuity to up to 2060, giving the usual post-operative drops and sent home to come for his one week visit. He comes to the clinic after one week with loss of vision. His vision came back to light perception. Now, interestingly, this guy had no pain. Uh, he said a little bit of discomfort. I don't think he was bothered because maybe his vision was so bad for so long, so he didn't think that was um, an issue. Now, when we examined him, uh, he had the classic hypobian, shallow AC, fibrin, uh, constricting the pupil with posterior synechiae. So at that stage, this happened during the COVID era, and in our hospital, I'm sure like everybody else, 
They will not admit the patient without doing a COVID test. We have to do the test for him, which will take at least three to four hours. We have the rapid test. So at that stage, um, I, I was called to see the patient. It was like three hours, 3 p.m. in the afternoon. So <clears throat> instead of waiting for the COVID and admission and doing a vitrectomy, uh, I um, elected to inject him, tap and inject the patient. And then by the time we did that, we did his COVID test and uh, um, we sent for uh, the results, uh, the, uh, uh, gram the, uh, the sample, the vitreous tap to cultures, which initially showed no organism with a few polymorphs. And we injected him, of course, with intravitreal antibiotics and steroids. And within 24 hours, he looked a little bit better. His, uh, his um, AC was still shallow. There was no hypobian. The fibrin was still there and his vision was still the same. Um, so um, he was growing uh, coagulase negative gram positive cocci. And at that stage, we elected to take him for surgery and I'll show you um, his surgery. So this is a 23 gauge uh, vitrectomy. You can see the uh, um, corneal edema. Um, uh, it's important to take care of the anterior chamber first. So you wanna um, uh, clear uh, the anterior chamber of the hypobian. You wanna remove the fibrin sometimes by uh, one of the forceps. I try to break the synechia. I see the cortex. There's still some cortex remaining. Um, in this case, you try to, um, uh, as much as you can, expand uh, the people to improve your view, clean the anterior chamber. Now, it's advisable when you're doing this to keep the infusion to the posterior chamber shut off. Otherwise, you will uh, have trouble. Uh, when Once you do that, you um, uh, turn your interest to the posterior chamber. I like to do a posterior capsulectomy where I remove the posterior capsule. In this case, specifically, I'm trying also to remove the cortex. Um, I do not uh, routinely uh, remove the uh, lens in these patients. Uh, this is the vitreous. And after doing a core vitrectomy, you can see the um, uh, opacified vitreous, the um, amount of uh, vitreous inflammation. You will soon notice the uh, ex uh, um, extended retinal hemorrhages. And I'm trying also to remove the, the, uh, the cortex, the remaining cortex. Um, I think we're, we're, we're advised now to do more than a core vitrectomy. If I used to, uh, this case 10 years ago, I would just have done a core vitrectomy and injected antibiotics. But now I'm doing more than that. Studies have shown that you wanna do more than core vitrectomy. You would like to try your best to induce a posterior vitreous detachment. It's very risky, but you wanna do your best to do that. As you can see in a few seconds, I'm trying to hold the posterior vitreous and you do a combination of tangential and um, um, anthroposterior traction to try to remove it as much as you can. But of course you wanna use your personal judgment, otherwise you will run into problems because the retina is very thin. But you will notice that the picture will be much different after you've done that. You can see now the disc. So I'm trying to hold here the posterior hyaloid. As you can see, I'm trying to uh, lift it up to try to induce the PVD very gently. And the idea is to decrease the amount of toxins and vitreous on the surface of the fovea and the um, optic disc. And, and once you do that, uh, the um, um, outcomes and the prognosis is much different. And you can see the different picture now where you can see the actual disc and the fovea, there's still hemorrhages all over the place. The retina is very thin, but uh, definitely the uh, picture is different. Uh, once you do that, um, you um, can inject your antibiotics at the end of this procedure, either through the ports or through the um, uh, sclera. Uh, and um, that I think concludes the case. Um, within a week um, post-operatively, you can see the difference in the top picture between intraoperative and at the end of the surgery. You can see the details where uh, preoperatively nothing can be seen. His vision improved to 2050, his IP is normal. And within a month, this patient is gone into 2040. Now he's still some hemorrhages. I remember he's also a diabetic. Um, I followed this patient up for six months and his vision is much, much better. He's 2030, his AC is quiet, his IP is normal, his retina is flat. And I, I don't feel we could have um, attained the same uh, results if we have just injected him without going for surgery. Now, for the sake of time, I'm gonna bypass the uh, next cases. I think I have two of them. And then I'll talk to the conclusion. The, the, there are a few practical points and I think this is for everybody. Um, um, there's a lot of personal experience with these cases because they're not common. Um, you wanna err towards a bigger gauge when you're doing these cases, although 25 gauge works also perfectly. Uh, it's very important that the anterior chamber is cleared first. And when you do that, make sure the posterior infusion is off. 
um, you want to do um, more than a core vitrectomy. And if you don't have a good sample, a good piece of advice is to start a vitrectomy under air because then you get a better sample. Uh, I do not remove the eye well. I, I leave antibiotics in the bag and I do my best to induce a PVD. And if I cannot induce a PVD, I'll do a fenestration of the posterior hyaloid to allow the antibiotics to touch the, um, the fovea. Uh, now, the take-home message in these cases is high index of suspicion, extremely important. You want to train your residents and fellows to uh, expect these cases. Um, you have to accept it. I have seen some anterior segment surgeon sit on these patients for a couple of hours or even a day thinking that this is just you know, regular post-operative inflammation. Um, I do sit with the patient and I talk to them about their prognosis, uh, despite the fact that uh, we do have a better prognosis with vitrectomy, but this is a bad disease. And most of these patients, unfortunately, do not regain good, good vision. Um, I, I, generally speaking, we've grown less aggressive. Um, 10 years ago, I would be more aggressive with a diabetic vitrectomy. But with endophthalmitis, I think I've become uh, more aggressive. I used to be less, but I've become more aggressive because I see better uh, outcome. Steroids are very important to me uh, and early surgery also if the condition allows. And I think the best treatment for these cases um, is prevention. Thank you very much. And I hope I, st I am still on time. Thank you for the-, the Thank you very much, Dr. Saad. Uh, thanks for an excellent presentation. So we can have now the discussions, panel discussions, and also with the speakers. I think this is the most important uh, to highlight some points. And uh, we will start maybe uh, about the first presentation that done by Dr. Uh, uh, Namrata about the wound-related uh, complication in PECO emulsifications. Uh, if there is any comments from any of the speaker, or we'll start with the panelists. Dr. Safan, if you have anything, we then yeah, just, Dr. Mohammed, just to allow about... me. Yeah, yeah. It, it, was, it was in my mind to share with the, with the, uh, with the yeah. speakers uh, uh, this present this uh, four slides. Uh, as we said, that the first day is very important to say whether we have um, uh, uh, any any uh, corneal edema and anterior ossity for the corneal edema is very important, uh, and it's a must in my opinion. So that case presents after an eventful um, uh, uh, surgery. Second day, there there is central corneal edema. So I send him to the OCT, and that was the surprise. You can see the. Uh, decimates membrane detachment and started from the uh, wound, uh, uh, main wound, main incisions. So uh, uh, that's what's immediately, I take, took him to the uh, theater and as I said, uh, I inject from the back, the posteriorly near to the um, uh, 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 six o'clock, uh, the injection, uh, get, uh, the air, and you can see that the air flattening most of the decimates membrane and that was immediately uh, uh, half an hour after the, the air injection, and this is one week uh, after the air injection, and that's the, the uh, still because I inject gas as of sex, and that's the, the picture of the cornea, it starts to be clear, and that's my message to, to the uh, uh, speakers. Great, thanks for you. Thank you, Dr. Safan, for to highlight this one. Okay. Uh, Dr. Yahya, you know, there is, uh, you know, Dr. Anamarata, she passed on many of the complication related to the uh, uh, wound. Uh, and yes, I think uh, she highlighted so many things. If uh, you can just give us like, you know, a point about this one. So to be kept in our mind related to that. To ask Dr. Sharma and uh, if, uh, to share a, a, her experience. In my experience, and this is a, a, an important point with this with membrane detachment, if it passes undiagnosed, you can still attach it with very good results even after a month. There are some papers that say okay. even six months. So I want to know Dr. Sharma's opinion because some people will just be afraid to interfere. But in my experience, even if you interfere later, the results are still are very good. I, I agree with you, uh, Dr. Eldon, completely. And uh, very nice, uh, shown, nicely shown by Dr. Uh, uh, Bayati about the anterior segment OCT. So we did a study where we took 100 consecutive cases of corneal edema, which were referred to us. And in all those cases, we did anterior segment OCT. And we found that uh, in most of the cases, the Desmond's membrane detachment was there and they were within eight weeks. So I can surely tell you that within eight weeks, if they present to you, 
and if you address them then the desmets membrane will get attached yes and yes. we had a success rate of almost 80% in those cases where the desmets membrane did did become attached asoct is also very useful because sometimes the post operative course is so stormy that you can't make out on a slit lamp where your detachment is it's it's absolutely the cornea is it matters it is completely white and you can't make out the uh, area of detachment so the first thing if the corneal edema is persisting after phaco emulsification is that you do anterior segment oct and just rule out or rule in the and the the desmets membrane detachment so i completely agree with you that even after a, i think that one thing should always be done before you tell patients to undergo for endothelial keratoplasty uh, because there are times uh, in my experience up to about 3 months or even 4 months we got the desmets membrane to attach if it was detached it also would depend on the extent of the detachment whether it is shallow or whether it is planar or it is non planar or the edges of the desmets membrane are scrolled if it is scrolled then it is very difficult to attach Yes. or they are you know uh, less than 1 mm if the separation is less than 1 mm then it is easier to attach okay. so those kind of things are there and then you have to take a call on whether you would use air or you would use c3f8 so if your desmet membrane attachment is superior you can get away with air but if it is inferior and non planar with scrolled edges then you have to Asepsis. ingest gas asepsis Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Doctor Anamata. Yes, Doctor Azena. Yes, please. Just a quick point, um, and I do think another reason it's important to do anterior segment OCT in those patients that we don't see desmes detachments that are sent to us, and they have inferior corneal edema. Think of retained lens fragment too. Yeah. So um, it helps to rule out that it is a desmes detachment, and then start thinking about other things uh, such as that. Um, uh, and Dr. Dr. Amal, if you have, yes, Dr. Yasin, sorry. Dr. Amal, that's a point. That's a wonderful point. Uh, and if it's a decimated detachment, it's usually the corneal edema is going to be early. If it's a lens fragment, it's usually going to see it later yes. when the steroids are being weaned yes. off and whatnot. So it's just the time frame. But if if you see corneal edema a month out or so, you definitely should do a gonioscopy and make sure that there's no retained lens fragments. Uh, Dr. Namrata, I totally agree with you. If it, there's a scroll or there's a fold in the decimase, that <clears throat> I cannot do that in the in the clinic. I have to take that to uh, that patient yeah. to the operating room. And I sometimes I've been successful in unscrolling. Uh, if it is a small, sometimes it just the endothelial cells actually do migrate and they just cover it. And if it is not in the visual axis, it's usually okay. But if it is and with persistent corneal edema, we should do something about it. and you don't have to do a whole dsec if everything fails or a whole dmac you know garrett mellis showed us that like a quarter pizza pie is reasonable in these cases so you don't need to do a whole lot hopefully sometime in the next year we will be actually uh, potentially doing endothelial cell therapy so that can be also another treatment but for that's too early for that uh, is there anyone to want to add in at this points dr amar dr amat yeah. uh, Actually, I just want to add a small point that Dr. Namrata uh, has highlighted in an excellent way. Usually, we do the rebubbling with an uh, flu uh, with an air, regular air, but uh, SF6 in cases of inferior detachment or in unusual situations. So that uh, that was an important thing to be highlighted. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, is there anything for uh, something? Any Dr. Yahya, you want? Just I, I want to ask you, Doctor Yahya, if you want in few few seconds, just what is the ideal way to make the uh, I mean the, um, the the wound, either the main wound or the uh, lateral side wounds? Uh, for, yeah, for for me, uh, of course, if if we can show it, but the most important is the beginning of the scratch. Usually, I tell my myself i do my, i do this and tell my residents that you need to do a scratch usually it's at exactly at the limbus even if there is some pannas it's okay if you have some bleeding and then you proper fixation of the eye is very important because you always have to have a controlled dissection and entry into the anterior chamber and for uh, for those Who, who are still starting and are afraid of doing the starting to do the surgery sometimes they are shy to go full 
with the full uh, keratome. And in this case, if they don't co go the full uh, passage of the keratome, it, they will get a smaller wound. And then the intended one, like 2.2, 2.4, or 2.8. So they have to see where the triangle ends. And this is what is the actual size they are going to get. And uh, uh, otherwise, they will get problems like uh, Dr. Uh, Namrata has shown. So it's very important to construct the, the wound properly and to dissect properly to see uh, after the scratch, then you dissect into the cornea. And the, uh, one of the good signs that uh, uh, you are going to the right plane that you see the reflection of the light of the microscope over the keratome, then you can dip into the anterior, uh, the distant membrane, puncturing after the proper length you want. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yahya. We can move to the second presentation by Dr. Yasin Daoud. If there is any comment from any of the panelists or speaker for Dr. Yasin or any questions. Well, Dr. Mohammed, there is a few things that I need to ask Dr. Yasin uh, related to the uh, lens okay. iris fixation. Uh, he didn't face any um, uh, fragmentation of the of the of the suture and uh, slipping of the lens from the from the iris because that's the pro that's the com main complication that we are facing and that's push us to shift for uh, scleral fixation or to Yamani technique. And mostly now we are doing Yamani technique because of that. I do agree that sometimes uh, uh, iris fixation iris lens fixation shows that it's easy way to approach and especially when we have a pupil, uh, pupil uh, or what, when we need a pupilloplasty so a combination it's, it's, it would be best but he didn't face this problem the fragmentation and the dislocation or subluxation of the of the uh, fixated okay. lens because of the irritation of the iris sorry uh, I can uh, we make this uh, fast comment because the time is running and the people you know yeah, sorry, but you need a very right. fast. Sorry. Uh, short uh, answer. Uh, Stark uh, published on about 278 patients. I published on about a similar number. And we have showed that actually uh, the possibility with, a, with five years uh, time, there's actually no uh, iris uh, problems, uh, we, uh, no suture erosion. The suture erosion was because of the eyelet. Most of the time it was cutting, but we know that the sutures do erode after a while. I am, any suture really does erode, except of the Gore-Tex probably now that we have been using. Since the Yamani, the Yamani has been my favorite technique for planned fixation, but sometimes the Yamani lens is not available, the CT Lucia, which is what we use here. So the, uh, the uh, iris suturing is a great technique for a primary if something happened, if you have zonular weakness and whatnot, and you need to fixate. Uh, but I agree with you that the scleral fixation probably over the long term is better watch until we publish the uh, papers about erosion of the bulbs uh, through the conjunctiva and complications of the Imani. No technique is perfect. Each patient is different. Dr. Yassin, I, like, I would like just to ask him, because always, uh, yeah, I need an answer for this. Why nobody is talking about pursuing clavation of iris claw lens? And it's, it gives very good results. It's very simple. And actually, there is just a publication, I think, this year, about comparison with the uh, different types of scleral fixation, and there is no difference in the visual outcomes of safety. So why we don't talk about it? So, uh, so a couple of things. Number one, uh, the AAO actually published a statement last year, earlier around April, and showing that there's no superiority of any technique, including ACI all, iris fixation, or scleral fixation. And I personally use all of them. It depends on what works in your hands. It depends on your experience and your expertise. And it depends on what patient population you're dealing with. If somebody has really thin sclera, that's not a great scleral fixation candidate, right? Number two is the iris claw in the US, we don't actually have it. So it's a, you know, we don't have FDA approval for it. In the India, whenever I gone to India, I know that they have used it. And one of the issues is they have had iris erosion. They have had decentration of the IOL. Dr. Namrata, if you want to comment on that, but here we don't have as much experience with it. Okay, Dr. Mm -hmm. Namrata, if you have a comment. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we've used it in a very limited number of cases. And uh, it's, a, it's a very good lens if your iris is okay and there are no problems with the iris. But if you don't have an iris or if you have iris atrophy or if you have iris shafik, etc., then of course you have to you know uh, uh, look at other alternatives. Yeah. 
Victoria Zen, I think she have a comment. Yeah, please. Yep, it'll be quick. Uh, we also published comparing iris sutured ACIOLs um, and scleral fixation from uh, 10 years of experience at Baylor. This was before the Yamani technique. And again, same visual outcomes. And if you look at all the studies, I think a large part should be surgeon comfort. And I agree, every single issue, every single procedure has an issue. The Yamani is a two point fixation. There's, we're looking at tilt right now um, and induced astigmatism. Uh, it's my go to technique, but it's not perfect. Um, our iris sutured patients had higher CME. Um, then the rest of it, even though the one with uh, the publication with PKP showed decreased compared to scleral sutured. So I just think there's so many confounding variables that we don't have a really good study and we still don't have long-term on the Yamani. I mean, it's, it's a very recent procedure in comparison to all these others. But again, I think it's surgeon comfort, learning the different techniques and then um, understanding what potential complications there are. Uh, Dr. Amal, please, if you have any comments, so we can yeah. move to the next. So for the, um, the iris claw lenses, even with the most experienced surgeons, I have seen cases where, you know, the lens is decentered, the patient is having uveitis, and I had to take out some of those lenses and replace them for Yamani. Now for the Yamani, I've been, uh, I had an excellent experience actually of 350 cases, and we have a long follow-up over about four years now. So the issue of erosion of the bulbs uh, through the conjunctiva is, is, is an issue. Uh, and it's very important, you know, to uh, cauterize the bulb in a wise way so that the uh, bulb at the end is completely uh, inside the sclera. Otherwise, it will erode. And actually, we've done a uh, few cases in the pediatric age group, ages six, seven, and eight. And in those specific ages, uh, I always worry about, you know, the patient rubbing his eye. And so we did a small modification where we place a suture over the uh, bulb after uh, having it, you know, inside the sclera to avoid the erosion. So, um, I, I had experience with all types of, uh, you know, iris sutured IOLs and these scleral fixated with Hoffman pockets. My uh, standard technique now is the Yamani, but, you know, there is no perfect uh, way to uh, fixate the lens to the sclera in uh, the absence of capsular support. I think uh, we are agreed that it is, uh, uh, according to your experience, you can stick to one method that you feel it's better and I think it will give you a better maybe result instead of having one instead of other ones. So everyone have, a, a, let's say, a advance and, and disadvantage of these techniques. Uh, we can move to the third presentation, which is uh, by uh, Dr. Zena about the anterior capsule. I think this is one of the most important things that everyone faces, and especially about the Argentina flag. And I want to ask especially about Dr. Yahya because one time we discussed this point and I want him to highlight about the tips that he can avoid to have Argentina in a very fast way, please. Yes, thank you. It was an excellent presentation by Dr. Zena. It really very addressed everything very clearly, but I just want to highlight some one point important in, in uh, this, she said, prevention of complications is more important than managing because you will avoid the complication. In my opinion, the, one of the things that help you to prevent complications and manage complications, regardless of what, what is the complication, is high magnification. If you train in high magnification, you see and know how each tissue behaves so you can avoid the complication. Second, if you are trained in high magnification, you can see the complication happening, not I, I, by indirect clues that the complication happened, like think a uh, posterior capsule opened, you say the anterior chamber is deep or the phaco is not working. This is secondary effect. The, the, the better training, you see the complication happening so you can manage it early so you have better results. As regards the, the and then also to have rules to avoid having complications in the anterior capsular rex in every step of the surgery. Lastly, about the uh, 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 avoiding yeah. Argentinian flag sign in intumescent cataract, I agree with that uh, deflation is very important, but again, it, it is about the rules. 
the rule to good, of good capsular access is that you are controlling the tearing in the in the in the capsule. And in the intumescent cataract, you have the anterior chamber pressure on the anterior capsule and vitreous pressure and the pressure inside the bag. So you have to con convert to equalize this by doing uh, my trick is doing the incision like Zena did, but once you do the incision, I curve it. So if there is gush of fluid, it will tear the anterior capsule to the direction I move. Then I aspirate and then inject viscoelastic, continue my rexes, and I can repeat aspiration as I go along. Whenever I feel there is a pressure gradient that will lead my tear to the equator. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Yahya, about this. Is there any comment or question to Dr. Zena from anyone from the panelists? Dr. Mohammed, can I can I say one thing? Yes, please. <clears throat> yeah, one of the things I've noticed also يعني, in training uh, residents and fellows while doing FACO is sometimes they do not fill the anterior chamber evenly. And if you get a tilt of the lens iris diaphragm, you tend to lose the anterior capsulorexis. So it's very important to train your residents to fill the anterior chamber evenly. So, in, in, so the whole thing is in the same level. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, is there any comment from any uh, any our, our? Okay, we can move. So, Doctor Zena, you have done a great job. There is no question for you. Um, now let's move to uh, our Doctor Ahmed Al Barqi. Uh, I think Dr. Ahmed al he is with us and he is already asleep, but he can answer if there is any questions. So I will start. No, no, but I'm still, still awake, boss. Still awake. Still awake. Very nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's just quiet. It's 11.15 now, but it's okay. Yeah. yeah. Just Ahmed start to be very quiet. That's why you cannot hear him or you cannot hear anything <laughs> okay. from anyone. Can you go Barqi. as fast as possible, please? If you don't so two mind. questions for Mohammed Barti. So the important thing is that you mentioned clearly and very nicely and then it steps the anterior vitrectomy and posterior vitrectomy. And let us say it in this way, anterior and posterior vitrectomy for anterior segment surgeon. But the question, when the anterior segment surgeon need to do anterior vitrectomy in a capsular rupture, when he need, or when that surgeon need to do anterior vitrectomy and when he should decide to do posterior vitrectomy, uh, sorry, I didn't. What do you mean by posterior vitrectomy? Okay, means the I, 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 I will clarify. Means the Dr. Can, can I clarify? Sorry, you mean please. Dr. Safani, you mean the party planner, right? Not si. posterior vitrectomy. No, 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 Ahmed, he means if you allow me, can you explain. Okay, <laughs> now I am an anterior <laughs> segment and I don't know to do posterior vitrectomy. So, okay. there is a time I can do an anterior vitrectomy when I can decide to do an anterior vitrectomy. And if there is something happened, then I have to close and send them to a posterior vitre. No, no, is that no, your Dr. question? Muhammad. No, no, Dr. Mohammed Al Amri, this is not the this is not the way. The <laughs> okay. issue is that in this way, if you if you allow me. Okay, the can you can that, give it in a direct way, Dr. Safan, please? So we can I'm, understand I'm, you. I'm, I'm, I'm give it to I believe I believe it's my mistake that I didn't pick up you, Dr. Safan. Sorry. So you have to rephrase it again. Sorry, that's my mistake. I didn't get it. Sorry. The surgeon have a rupture posterior capsule. And okay. that rupture definitely in a different way. And that yes. surgeon, he need to decide using the cutter through the corneal incision or doing, do it posteriorly. That's the important point that we need to discuss it for all our residents because that will, will change our result. In, in other way, we need to preserve the posterior capsule or we need to decide that we lost it. Okay, so I think it depends on the size uh, of the capsular tear. If you have a big capsular tear, you lost all the capsule. For example, if you rupture the capsule using the FACO Pro, for example, I think the, you will have insufficient and big, uh, big uh, rupture with your capsule, and then you have a lot of vitreous coming in the anterior chamber. For me, if you want to decide to do the anterior vitrectomy through the baracentesis versus the uh, parsa plana, as I mentioned in my talk, the, the, the most efficient way is to do it through the power supply. It's more uh, anatomically and you're calling the vitreous back to the normal position and also avoid traction. And you will avoid a lot of sweeping in the anterior chamber because 
the vitreous even is attached to the wound. If you cut it from the uh, from posteriorly, you are sure that you cut all the adhesion. But in case, the most important point is you have to remove all the vitreous inside the EC. This is the job of the anterior segment surgeon. I think all anterior segment surgeon can do anterior vitrectomy and prepare everything. In case of you have dropped the nucleus, the, the scenario is different for sure. You have to clear the vitreous and hand over to the anterior uh, VR surgeon. I hope so I answered your question. Yeah, when we need to uh, reduce or prevent enlarging a small tear in the posterior capsule, we need to go posteriorly, Dr. Ahmed. When we need to clean the anterior chamber from the vitreous totally, yes, that's, that's the way we can go. Because if you will go a small tear, you will enlarge it and you will lose the posterior capsule. This is my opinion. And this is the approach that I'm going through to do it. So when I have a small tear and I need to preserve it, I will go posteriorly and I took the vitreous from that hole and preserve it. And if there is any, any remnant of the posterior capsule, I can trim it and then I can implant my lens you, in you the usually, posterior doctor, capsule. Usually, okay, yeah, yeah, one, I, I agree with you, you. Usually, Dr. Safwan, yes, I yeah, agree with you, but usually if you have a small tear in the posterior capsule, what, you, what I've seen with most surgeons doing, usually if you have a small a central posterior capsular tear, the amount of vitreous is not perhaps a lot. So most of them, the injective visco, heavy viscoelastic in this hole, pushing the vitreous posteriorly, and you check for any vitreous there. If you cannot find any vitreous there, so you can continue the surgery. You don't need to do vitrectomy because if there is no vitreous prolapse, there is no vitrectomy. I mean- We are talking the, about the vitreous any, prolapse, Ahmed. Ah, I mean, I mean- not, There is a not full every... vitreous prolapse, but th through a small, a small okay. posterior- Can capsule. we move yeah. to our next point, if you allow me, because also the time is- uh, Is there uh, any other comments about this one from Dr. Uh, Saad, Dr. because you are a yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yes, yeah, very yeah. fast, yeah. Dr. Saad. Yeah, sure, sure. I, I just- I just uh, think everybody should stick to his own subspecialty. Um, I would certainly prefer the anterior but segment. are an anterior segment, you want to go posterior. What is no, 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 no. <laughs> Trust me, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. I think, um, you know, you want to clear your anterior segment, uh, put your eye well, if you think there is good capsular support, and send the patient. I totally agree with Dr. Albarti. You shouldn't fish for the pieces. You shouldn't try to uh, do the trectomy. Um, I think it's very safe to allow the uh, posterior segment surgeon to do that uh, because putting a, a, a single uh, pass plana uh, incision is not going to do the trick. Thank you very much. Okay, is there any comments or uh, about this issue about Dr. Ahmed yeah, from yeah. Dr. Zena, please? Go ahead, yeah, I, first of all, I thought that was a phenomenal talk, uh, Dr. Ahmed. Um, I, I'm a firm believer, which a lot of anterior segments aren't comfortable doing pars plana. Um, so I, I really love doing pars plana anterior vitrectomy. But the way I view it, and I felt that your PowerPoint was really kind of spoke to it, is that at some parts of the procedure I do through the limbus. So I remove some of the vitreous. I go back and forth. And then sometimes I'll go through the pars plana <laughs> to bring down the vitreous. So I don't really see it as one versus the other. It's just kind of a different incision that gives me more access. And again, I am not a vitreo retinal surgeon. And I agree with Dr. Wahib that I don't go fishing for things and I know my limitations, right? It's not really trying to get, it's basically to clear out the anterior segment so I can put a secondary eye well. That's really my goal and then leave everything else for retina. Um, Dr. Yassine, one, thing, sorry. one really quick point I do just an, a small limited pyridomy, an MVR blade, and then I suture my, uh, you know, again, pars plana incision. I'm not comfortable doing trocards. I'm not comfortable doing these, you know, you know, again, leakless incisions. Is that okay for an anterior segment surgeon? Any points um, or recommendations otherwise? Uh, Zayn, Victoria, uh, you make a great point. I think pars plana vitrectomy is protective to the cornea. I think it's not incarcerating things. It's a lot cleaner, it's dynamic where the fluid is coming in. You can use your anterior vitrector through the pars plana. I believe in this day and age, every anterior segment surgeon should be able to do limited pars plana vitrectomy so that you at least clean the, uh, the back. I start with pars plana, then I'll actually go to the anterior to see if there's any residual vitreous. But otherwise, it's my go-to technique. It's a lot cleaner, especially if you're gonna put a secondary IOL and whatnot, you know that even if you clean from the front, the sideways is still not there. So 
Ars plena is the way to go. Please don't touch I, the machine in the process. I, I, I so just, I just make a, a comment, very short comment about this. I agree with you. It's more more trendy now doing the trokers and and the first planet. Sure, it's a, it's a good idea. But this does not negate that you can do a perfect anterior vitrectomy through the limbus. And the idea, the whole idea, is how you do it. And now even with the twenty three gauge, it's much better. And the trick is, as you said, the fear that you are going to pull on more vitreous. And this is the fear of the limbal approach. And the trick to avoid this that we have used long time ago when we, in pediatric cataract surgery, that you dip with your vitrector in through the, the opening into the vitreous. So you create a cavity that pulls down the, the vitreous. So when doing the vitrectomy, you will not get more vitreous. And this is a clean, very clean way and you can check any vitreous strength in the anterior chamber using a fine spatula from paracentesis and sweeping from the periphery to the center. And I'm, I'm saying this because not every doctor, in, not every hospital will have the trokers and we should not just tell people not to do it. If they do it in the right way, the results is, in my opinion, as good as the number part. I do both. Thank you, Dr. Yahya. Is there any comments Dr. from Dr. Amal or Dr. Imad? Okay, we can go to the last uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I think the Dr. Saad about post-operative uh, endophthalmitis. Is there any question or comment to Dr. Saad? Sir Mohammed, one comment to Dr. Saad and is that, uh, uh, did you try any combination of antibiotic other than vancomycin and uh, ciftazidine? Definitely, you were lucky that that in your case the, the 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 bacteria was sensitive to vancomycin and ciftazidine when you did it as a, a vitrectomy early without waiting for the culture and drug sensitivity. Dr. Sad. Okay, you give the vanco for the gram positive, and the ciftaz or the amikacin for the gram negative, and you do that empirically before knowing. Uh, you know, the results, once you get any results, and we know that from literature, only 50% of these cases will grow bacteria, then you can treat accordingly because they do culture and sensitivity. But um, um, routinely we use these two um, antibiotics. Dr. Any other questions? Yes, uh, I have a comment and a question. Uh, one comment is that in, in the case you showed, Doctor, of course, uh, you are an excellent surgeon and excellent presentation, uh, uh, excellent cases presented. Thank but you. I don't consider that you have done an early vitrectomy. This is very late vitrectomy. The vision was dropped to light perception. And actually, this is the indication of the vitrectomy endosomitis study in the 1990. And uh, I, I don't agree of the, uh, with, with the COVID. This is an emergency. Our hospital will not admit, re requires culture, but except for emergency cases. You take care because you postponed surgery for one day already, it was late. In my opinion, as you said, pain is not the, uh, uh, the major thing. But immediately, if I see the patient with uh, any the reaction, uh, I'm suspecting that the, the, uh, it is endothermite vitrectomy. As you said, is the is the solution. Second, second, uh, the prevention is important, and now we use endo, intracapsular antibiotic, which is very important to inject it in the capsular bag. The uh, antibiotic. Third, you did not mention, which is I, I think because of the time about propionibacterium infection, which is an important thing that we should uh, all be aware of. Late end of some months. Okay, can you comment very fast, Dr. Saad, sure. about this three sure. words, uh, then we can uh, conclude. I hope I, hope, I hope I understood the question well. Uh, for the COVID testing, this is the policy of the hospital. Uh, we cannot overrule it. Um, uh, for the um, uh, P. acne endophthalmitis, uh, this is chronic and the topic is acute. So uh, that's why I did not mention uh, P. acne endophthalmitis. Uh, now, uh, what I'm trying to say is that um, even if the patient vision was counting finger, I would still, um, you know, um, think that earlier vitrectomy is the way to go. Definitely, definitely. Uh, um, um, the fact that the patient presented late, 
but from the time he presented, we acted immediately. Uh, and I totally agree on the fact that uh, time is very, uh, very critical in these cases. And that's why we uh, elected to inject the patient until we get the COVID test. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, uh, we are already too late, especially for Dr. Namrata already is um, maybe around one o'clock in the midnight. So thank you very much for all our speakers for an excellent presentation. We hope that we cover all the points in related to uh, FACO immersification. I know sometimes even only one topic, it needs one webinar, but this is a general information, general, uh, uh, I mean, uh, pros and cons, and we have just to cover certain point and to highlight about a very important point. I, I hope that we highlighted uh, uh, nicely by our eminent speakers, and thanks for all of you for being with us. Thanks for the... Uh, our management event and for the sponsoring company for this webinar. Thank you, and we hope to see Thank you, you inshallah. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you all. Good night. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Dr. Namrata. Thank you. Sorry for Thank delaying you. you. Sorry, no, we are sorry for that. But we cannot change the timing between difference between you and us.